mic check one, two. Once again, please, at this time, find your seats. We'll be getting started shortly. I appreciate it. The hearing is coming to order. Good morning and thank you for coming to today's hearing on NYCHA's physical needs assessment and capital repairs. I am Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel and I chair the Committee on Public Housing and I am joined this morning by the co-chair of today's hearing, Council Member Vanessa Gibson who chairs the Capital Budget Committee. And we are also joined by Minority Leader Council Member Mateo, I mean, sorry, Matteo, Council Member Gradenchik, and Council Member Menchaca. Due to chronic divestment coupled with mismanagement and organizational failures, NYCHA is in a desperate financial situation. This is neither new nor surprising. But the physical needs assessment, which lists the cost to replace major property components at NYCHA, is a surprise. In my district alone, Van Dyke One is in need of $341 million for capital repairs, and that is just one development. According to the most recent physical needs assessment, or PNA, NYCHA needs some $32 billion over the next five years. This is double the amount that NYCHA said it needed after its last p in 2011, and nearly five times as much as it was needed in 2006. The jump from $7 billion to $32 billion is staggering, and we need to have a real conversation about how NYCHA plans to address its deficit and make the necessary capital repairs, especially in the climate of mistrust and lingering lawsuits. One strategy to generate funds for much needed repairs is development. And the Public Housing Committee's hearing on development last month, NYCHA alluded to a plan in progress known as Next Gen 2.0 and indicated that we would receive a copy of the plan soon. We have not received a copy, but it's our understanding that the press has it. It's a, bit it's a bit disconcerting that NYCHA would deny the committee the opportunity to have an in-depth review of the development plan along with the administration, but it's my sincere hope that the plan contains or will contain input and feedback from stakeholders who can actually provide solutions. And I look forward to giving it the intensive review that it deserves. I further expect NYCHA to tell us today how its new development plans will finance capital repairs at NYCHA and how the buildings are being prioritized. I recognize that funding is hard to come by. And just yesterday, the federal district court rejected the consent decree with NYCHA that decree would have provided millions of dollars of critically needed resources, which are now on hold. I would like to hear from NYCHA about what happens to the capital funding and what's next. But first, as always, I just want to recognize and say thank you to our council staff, who has put in a lot of time and effort and energy. I want to thank Madiba Denny, the legislative council, as well as Jose Condi, our legislative senior policy analyst, along with all of the other council staff. Um, and next we'll hear from the co-chair of today's hearing, Councilwoman Vanessa Gibson. Thank you so much, Chair, and good morning to each and every one of you. Welcome to the City Council, to our chambers. Uh, really an honor and privilege to be here with my colleague, our Chair of the Committee on Public Housing, Councilmember Alika Amprey samuel and we are delighted to provide today's joint hearing today on NYCHA's 2017 Physical Needs Assessment. Um, as everyone knows, NYCHA serves nearly 400,000 low and moderate income New Yorkers and is truly an essential 
essential part of our city's commitment to providing affordable housing for all New Yorkers. However, we all recognize that the Housing Authority has been under uh, extreme financial constraint and really has not provided every resident with access to decent, safe, and affordable housing as it is required. Many of the apartments in our buildings and infrastructure are falling apart. Um, in March of this year, the State Department of Health found that 83 percent of all of the inspected units contained some condition that could potentially pose a health hazard to tenants and residents. NYCHA residents are truly, truly in need. Uh, the NYCHA needs are staggering, as we know. The 2017 physical needs assessment projects $32 billion in unmet need, or more than $180,000 per apartment. This is really a result of years of underinvestment and a true poor allocation of resources. We've recognized the federal government, um, the state, and the city truly must all step up and demonstrate real leadership to effectuate change. Uh, the investments will not be effective unless they are coupled with serious reforms to NYCHA's capital process. Even if NYCHA did not have a gap in funding for the capital need identified in the PNA, it is unclear that it would have the capacity to execute capital projects needed to bring the portfolio into good repair. NYCHA has been slow to commit the limited capital that it is allocated. The NYCHA's capital commitment rate, which is 22 percent in 2017, is really significantly below the citywide's average of 56 percent. NYCHA residents must be confident that all repairs will be done effectively, efficiently, and in a timely manner, and they cannot afford to wait, particularly when the health and safety of all of our families are truly at risk. It is clear that we must all do a better job completing projects as expeditiously as possible. In order to assist NYCHA in effect effectively deploying its resources to improve the conditions for all residents and families, this City Council remains ready, willing to help NYCHA advocate at the state level for full design build authority, which would decrease the cost of construction projects and expedite the timeline for completing the projects. As a former member of the New York State Assembly, um, I recognize that the state must do more, and I do want to acknowledge that in this year, we did achieve design build authority, but certainly not to the magnitude that is needed here in our city. With limited resources, NYCHA has long been forced to prioritize among its capital projects. The 2017 physical needs assessment reveals that NYCHA apartment interiors are the single largest category of capital need, almost 40 percent of the total projected need. However, NYCHA's 2018 through 2022 capital plan prioritizes structural and exterior improvements, which are slated to receive two-thirds of all planned expenditures and more than five times the amount slated for apartment interiors. While maintenance of building envelopes is laudable, I truly encourage NYCHA to be mindful that tenants are suffering today in many unsafe interior conditions do not necessarily experience the direct benefit from all of the exterior spending. Exterior and interior are truly, truly important. No New Yorker should suffer the indignity of living in substandard, unsafe conditions in this city. We truly owe it to every resident of housing in our city to work together and find solutions. So I look forward to this morning's conversation and really want to thank everyone for being here, particularly the tenants and the community groups and advocacy groups. There is nothing more powerful than the voice of a tenant. The tenants live in these conditions every single day. And whether we are doing press releases, uh, whether we're walking through our developments, we must recognize that the tenants live in these conditions each and every day. Within my council district alone, I represent Washington Avenue, Butler, 
Claremont Parkway, Claremont Rehab, College Avenue, Forest, Franklin Avenue, Highbridge Gardens, Highbridge Rehab, McKinley, Morris One, Morris Two, Morrisania, Morrisania Airites, Sedgwick, Teller Avenue, and Webster Houses. I represent over 24,000 residents that live in housing, and according to my projected amount in the PNA of that $32 billion, I need $1.6 billion so I can invest in my own district alone. So we're talking about a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of investments, and we really want to make sure that at the end of the day, we are doing everything possible. This is much more than a hashtag a press release, a press advisory. This is everyday living for residents in public housing. And so I want especially the tenants to recognize your presence here is important. It's not easy to come to City Hall, and we want to thank you because you represent thousands of your neighbors and your family that live in housing, and we truly want them to understand that your voices are not lost in this process. We have to do better. And this city council has been an equal partner with this administration. Individual council members, we invest our own capital dollars towards NYCHA to upgrade facade, elevators, lighting, intercom, playground, basketball court, everything you can think of. And we will continue to do that. We don't sit here and just criticize, but we are a part of this process. We don't just talk about it, but we make sure that we are making investments in our own districts as well. And so I want to thank everyone for being here and want to acknowledge the staff who have done an incredible amount of work with today's hearing, our Deputy Director Nathan Told, our Unit Head Chima Obi Chair, our Principal Financial Analyst Sarah Gastelum, our Senior Counsel Rebecca Chasen, and Assistant Counsel Noah Brick. Always also want to acknowledge the presence of Councilmember Carlos Menchaca of Brooklyn. And with that, we look forward to today's hearing. We are thankful for everyone's presence here today. And now I turn our hearing back over to my co-chair and colleague, Councilmember Alika Amprey samuel Thank you. Before we hear from the first panel of residents, um, I just want to make note that we do have to be out of the chamber by 1 o'clock today because there are two other hearings that are being held in the chamber as well as the committee room, and so we'll need to make sure that we're conscious of our time. And so everyone today will be on a time limit of two minutes. Um, so with that, we'll hear from our first panel of residents. So Ms. Margaret. Ms. Blondell, Karen Blondell, and Mr. Michael Higgins. Michael Higgins. Oh, okay. Is he also, he's a resident? And Miss Leah James. Okay, we'll actually get started and he can just join in when he returns. And we've been joined by Council Member Helen Rosenthal. And we're also being joined by Councilwoman Diana Ayala. And you can get okay. Thank you. You can get started, and we have a two-minute clock. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, 
I'm Margaret Massey from Oceanside, and also I'm a resident, I'm sorry, I'm a New York City NYCHA resident and a member of Community Voices Heard. I'm here because I would like to say we need to save public housing because over 400,000 people live in public housing of mixed income. Um, most of the people in public housing are working people. We're taxpayers. And because we're one out of 14 that live in public housing in New York City, we are a great uh, number in the fabric of society in New York. As public housing is affordable housing, and we need affordable housing in New York. Affordable housing is shrinking as regentrification is growing. And right now, as we spoke about the safety of the people in public housing, these people are just human beings. And I would like to say I want the government to stop fighting against the people, but for the people. The agency needs funds to run. We would like $1 billion a year for NYCHA for repair. We would like for you to fight for us. And um, we need to sue the federal government because it's their fault that the housing is in the condition that it's in. And the health and safety of people are in jeopardy. And because it is their fault, they need to bail us out. If they bailed out the banks for $700 billion, they need to bail us out also, because we're well worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good to see you again, although not in these circumstances. Um, I'll be relatively brief. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Higgins. I'm a community organizer for a group called Fury, Families United for Racial and Economic Equality. We're, we're down in Brooklyn. Um, I'm here just to briefly talk uh, real quick about um, our work in Gowanus around uh, the recent consent decree that was denied by Judge Pauly just yesterday and how this is an opportunity to, for the city to potentially do better. So the original consent decree was to give the, give the DOJ within the that uh, the stipulation's $2 billion over 10 years. $2 billion isn't small, but it's not enough, especially if we have 32 billion needs and needs in the next five years. So I would say it's in the interest of the council to do the residents of the city, especially in public housing, um, the service of actually giving the $2 billion anyway, because I think you know the city has that funding if, if it wants to move around its priorities. I also want to really briefly talk about uh, how do we engage residents within um, really assessing um, the needs at a very local development by development level um, in terms of what does each development need and making sure that the, you know money gets spent you know at the at the beginning the right way and continues to be spent the right way um, as a part of CCOP, the citywide council of presidents each uh, different branch of that at that body has what's supposed to be a modernization committee, which is actually supposed to overlook and kind of see, you know, going forward, uh, the needs of each development within their different branch. And I think that's a, something that needs to be taken even further and taken down to the local level. I think this is an opportunity to really talk to with residents for the first time in a long time about what do their developments actually need and give them the tools to actually advocate for themselves. Thank you. Good morning, um, everyone. My name is Karen Blondell, and I am a organizer for the Fifth Avenue Committee Turning the Tide Environmental Justice Group. I'm also a resident of the Red Hook Houses, and I also taught myself building systems. I'm a graduate from new non-traditional employment for women, and um, I know a lot about systems because I live in public housing. With that being said, I also learned the policies across uh, city, state, and local. And so I'm very happy that the decision was uh, denied to accept the settlement from New York City. I do believe that that $2 billion should still be used in good faith 
towards public housing needs. If the city can put together $1.5 billion for Amazon, we should in good faith take 10% from each developer who's getting a tax break to go into public housing. We need to start using value capture to bring money back into these developments. It's unfair to talk about affordable housing when public housing is a separate program that actually deals with people of less of fortune in regards to income. Uh, as Michael said, a modernization and repair committees is the way that HUD set it up to work in public housing, but uh, with the, uh, without having standardized uh, bylaws and um, uh, uh, resident councils, that's never gonna happen because it has to start with the tenants at that level. I am asking and requesting that we not only look at the physical needs assessment from an engineering standpoint, but from a resident, I live in it standpoint. And we need to bring those two groups together after first educating the residents on building systems. We need to bring them together and let the resident and the engineers hash out the priorities for each development. We cannot look at this as $32 billion. We have to compartmentize it based on needs. I know that you, um, the council member next to Alika, you have a very big portfolio of public housing residents, and quite honestly, your buildings are in more deterioration than ours are. That doesn't mean that we want to wait till we get to that point in Red Hook and Gowanus. We want to capture it before it gets to that point. We also have Sandy money in those locations. All of this needs to be factored into these physical needs assessments, uh, brought out to the tenants. The tenants should speak about this to the engineers, and then we should move forward with that. I do agree with a receivership, uh, which is what Judge Pauly is contemplating, because that puts HUD back in the position, because they are also culpable in this. If, you're, if your inspectors could go out for years and be duped not to open a door or touch a wall to find out that that wall is actually uh, uh, masking tape, there's a problem in HUD too. So I'm not looking at just NYCHA, I'm looking at all three forms of government plus the governance inside of public housing in regards to the resident engagement, 964. Also, 1437 of the HUD rule says that if they are in apartments that are toxic, you have to move them out into a similar, reasonably accommodated location without those, um, without those toxins. We have all of this affordable housing that's vacant right here in New York City. Maybe we need to move the tenants or give them priority in affordable housing until the public housing buildings are fixed. Red Hook was built like a, it is built during the war and the structure is strong. We have Sandy money for the campus, but we need money for the plumbing and we need to know, the residents need to know the maintenance schedule on the waste traps, on the sewer lines, on the electrical things. If we know those things, we can work together as long as our, our resident associations allow we can work together with all of you to make public housing a great place again. Thank you. Oh, and we have testimony. I just didn't read it verbatim, but it is full packed <laughs> with recommendations. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chair, Co-Chair, Council, and NYCHA. Uh, my name is Leah James. I'm born and raised in public housing. My mother still lives in public housing and I'm the lead organizer on equitable economic development at Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition. Um, currently, well now, for like a year and a half, Northwest Bronx has been offering resources to public, uh, NYCHA development Bailey Houses on 193rd Street and uh, by the Kingsbridge and Norwood Ave um, area. What I mean by resources is that um, our efforts have been to reduce health and asthma in the Bronx as a whole. Um, and that's our goal. And so we created a program called Healthy Buildings. And we work with HPD as well. And so Bailey Houses is in our catchment area. And that's, like I said, our goal is to reduce asthma and health disparities in the Bronx. So we did a, uh, our own needs assessment in Bailey. We put them in the Healthy Buildings program. We went to, it's, 20, it's 233 units. We went to every single tenant, along with the resident council who's very active and, and strong, 
and we knocked on every door to see who has asthma on their child. 75% residents in Bailey houses have asthma, but we need to find out what triggered it. And this Healthy Buildings Program is partnered with, uh, also with Councilman, Councilman Richie Torres, Monteferry Hospital, St. Barnabas, and the Department of Health. And along with that, we, we had a workforce opportunity. We actually trained um, some residents to be community health workers. So they have certificates to do door knocking on their own. Um, but we noticed in the apartments, we knew that it was a lot of mold, leakage, infestation of, um, of roaches, and we couldn't figure out why. So we conducted a tour with our elected officials, um, uh, Senator Gustavo, that was short, Senator Gustavo Rivera, um, Assemblyman Victor Pachado, um, Councilwoman Alika Samuels, and we did a tour from top to bottom and do an assessment. What we found out is that the roof had <laughs> very, it, 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 was, it was leaking. And when we did the tour in the summertime, the 20th floor is the top floor. From 20 to 13, it was leaking. Now the leaks went down to the sixth floor. So we also looked at what other resources we can do, and we said we want to do weatherization in this building. And we have the capacity to do weatherization in this building. Um, and we could also do integrated pest management. We could clean out the pests ourselves, do green cleaning in apartments to reduce the asthma level. Um, but we can't do weatherization unless the roof gets fixed. So working with our elected officials, um, Assemblyman Victor Pachado said he would allocate the cost of $3 million. There is an award letter. And we want to know what's the process of moving forward so that we can get this roof done and we can offer weatherization. And we also partner with hostels to do trainings for residents to do integrated holistic, integrated pest management. Some residents already got certified by the state to do that. So they're working on our private buildings that we do housing organizing. So we looked at the PNA um, in 2017. Bailey's uh, roof is not on their PNA. I looked at 2011 uh, PNA. Bailey's roof is not on there as well. Maybe it's education on our part, but we don't know. Um, you know, why is it not there? And folks, you know, is the asthma and the health disparities is getting worse in the building. Um, so also in the PNA, on that maybe y'all could educate us on this, but in the PNA uh, for Bailey, it says $82,529 for playgrounds <laughs> and 14756 for sidewalks. From working with the residents, and we have, a time, we have priorities, we listed it. They, we do this at every meeting of what is a priority so it could be an escalation of repairs. And playgrounds and sidewalks is not a priority. I want to know if it's possible, and maybe I'll learn that today, how can that money be allocated to individual um, apartment repairs? If y'all pass this thing for the roof, we do weatherization, the apartments uh, get done, and then we have a beautiful day. So, and also we would like to partner with NYCHA. We've been, uh, NYCHA system, I mean, the, the, the administration is so complex, I don't know who to talk to, but we've been reaching out for a month to see how we could become a community partner because it's also a workforce opportunity that we can do to, to, to get residents jobs. And then when that roof does get passed, we have a list of general contractors, Bronx-based, MWBE general contractors that's willing to hire locally or the residents train them so that we could do a roof because we don't want to scaffold up for five years, right? So we providing from point A to point B. So I want to know how can we partner to move this forward and be an example of NYCHA partnering with community-based organizations that have resources to do capital improvements. Thank you. Before, before the resident panel um, leaves, are there any quick follow-up or clar clarification questions at all? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And we've been joined by Council Member Keith Powers and Council Member Donovan Richards. Okay, so next up is our panel from NYCHA. Ms. Deborah Goddard, the Executive Vice President of Capital Projects, along with Mr. James Scallon, Vice President for Capital Projects.
Okay, can you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Okay, you can proceed. Good morning. Chairs Alika Sampri, I'm sorry, Alika Ampri Samuel and Vanessa Gibson, members of the Committee on Public Housing and Subcommittee on Capital Budget, and other members of City Council, good morning. I am Deborah Goddard, Executive Vice President for Capital Projects. I'm pleased to be joined by James Scanlon, our Vice President for Capital Planning and Design, and other members of NYCHA's team. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss NYCHA's 2017 Physical Needs Assessment, the PNA. A thorough accounting of the authority's short and long-term capital needs, including apartment, architectural, electrical, mechanical, and site needs for each development. These estimates help inform capital planning for infrastructure improvements, modernization, and other systemic upgrades. Available on our website, the PNA is updated every five years. NYCHA's previous PNA was developed in 2011, 2012. In 2016, NYCHA procured the team of STV, AECOM, well-respected engineering and construction management firms to perform a PNA of all of our developments. Beginning in May of 2016, about 140 inspectors spent 10 months assessing our properties. The 27 PNA, which was issued this year, as you know, identified $31.8 billion in capital needs across the authority. The 2017 PNA reflects improvements in assessment methods over the 2011 PNA. For example, inspectors conducted the first energy audit of NYCHA's portfolio, and aerial infrared scans of our buildings indicated where there are leaks in roofs. As a result, the 2017 PNA provides more accurate data on building components and additional detail on existing conditions. It also provides greater detail on the cost of the work needed at our properties. The 2017 PNA shows that the greatest needs are for apartments, about $13 billion, architectural, about $11 billion, which includes windows, stairs, roofs, and entry doors, and mechanical at about $3 billion, which includes heating and water systems. The previous PNA, as you've mentioned, indicated capital needs of $16.6 .6 billion across the authority. For instance, kitchens, bathrooms, roofs, heating systems, and elevators accounted for about 6.6 .6 billion of the total need then. Today, in contrast, these needs stand at about 11.6 billion. There are several reasons the PNA increased from 6.6 .6 to 31.8 billion. Much of the unmet capital needs in the 2011 PNA were carried forward to the 27 PNA. This was inevitable given that NYCHA received only 1.5 billion from HUD over the past five years, and the $16.6 .6 billion need represents only the most immediate five-year need. And of course, there was continued deterioration of NYCHA's aging properties, which accounts for about $5.2 billion of the increase. It's important to note that almost 10 billion two-thirds of the increased cost is tied to factors other than the condition of the buildings. Inflation increased costs by about $4.4 billion. And as we are all aware, NYCHA continues to ex New York continues to experience a huge construction boom, taxing resources, and leading to a market escalation costing about $5.4 billion to NYCHA. NYCHA is confronting significant and fundamental challenges that have contributed to the rise in the authority's capital needs. Since 2001, the federal government has reduced NYCHA's funding by a total of approximately $3 billion, half of which is capital funding, and this does not account for the impact of inflation. To put that in perspective, during this same period, when NYCHA suffered from a substantial loss of resources to repair and improve our buildings, the city's budget has more than doubled which is likely true for any municipal budget. At the same time, NYCHA's buildings, the majority of which are more than a half century old, continue to age and deteriorate, increasing the costs to maintain and improve them. We developed NextGen NYCHA, our long-term strategic plan to address these enormous challenges by stabilizing the authority's finances and securing additional resources to help ensure its longevity. We are reducing our property's capital needs through several key next-gen initiatives. HUD's Rental Assistance Demonstration, RAD program, is enabling us to convert certain developments to a Section 8 funding stream. 
In 2015, we announced that 15,000 units would be converted to Section 8 through RAD. However, as Chair Brezhnev said at last month's Council hearing, we are seeking to increase implementation of the RAD program substantially. Through PAC for the unfunded units, we are transferring apartments that do not receive dedicated federal funding to the Section 8 program. This will generate funds for repairs and renovations at those sites. We're fortunate that Mayor de Blasio has devoted unprecedented resources for public housing. With $1.2 billion committed by the mayor over 10 years, we are replacing more than 950 roofs, benefiting over 175,000 residents. And about $875 million of the historic grant we received from FEMA for Sandy recovery at our impacted developments will go toward capital improvements captured in the PNA. Through HUD's Energy Performance Contracting Program, we are investing about $230 million in new boilers and heating systems, as well as new lighting and water conservation measures, improvements funded by the cost savings from reduced energy consumption. We are also investing the federal government's five-year projected allocation of $1.3 billion in capital funding in critical areas such as building envelopes, core systems, and bathroom renovations. As you know, the state has allocated $450 million in capital funding to NYCHA, although it has yet to be received. These funds would be repairing heating systems at approximately 24 developments and elevators at approximately 11 developments. All told, these investments and strategies, along with other government commitments, will reduce NYCHA's capital needs by billions of dollars. And while NYCHA certainly appreciates every dollar we're receiving, the increase in capital projects has stressed our capacity. Therefore, we are increasing our infrastructure by bringing on program managers to augment our current staff. Given the uncertainty in federal funding from year to year, we do not believe it is prudent to hire significantly more permanent staff to manage our capital budget. Unfortunately, there is no magic wand that will summon the funds to address all of NYCHA's outstanding capital needs. However, we are doing everything we can to preserve and improve our buildings, including using our limited funding wisely, pursuing RAD and other development programs, and advocating for additional funding from all levels of government, especially the federal government. We must take an aggressive approach, using every tool at our disposal to bring more resources to the authority and our residents. Thank you, council members, for your support. We value the discretionary funding that you provide for us and our residents. We look forward to our continued partnership to improve the quality of life of our residents, and we are happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your presence and your testimony, and certainly um, all of the work that has really been done to get us to this point. Um, I think you know we must acknowledge the unprecedented amount of capital funds that this administration has invested in NYCHA. I guess my growing concern, and it continues to grow day by day, is the time frame. Um, we're talking about money that is invested over the next five and ten years, um, but every day residents in NYCHA are suffering. Um, and so as chair of the subcommittee on capital, my focus has been from the prelim to executive to the adoption to really look at some of the internal mechanisms that NYCHA has as it relates to drawing down on this money. The 22% commitment rate that NYCHA has is, is really concerning to me because with all of the money that NYCHA is receiving, both from the feds and the state and the city, we're still having challenges drawing down on that money. And so in your testimony, you talked about the staffing. And I want to dig a little bit deeper because I want to understand what the internal staff looks like. The project managers, the architects, the designers, the vacancy rate, the retention rate, how, we, how are we retaining staff, and how are we really able to spend more of this money? Um, please help me understand what the staff looks like today in terms of what it will look like moving forward and how can this council be supportive of making sure that NYCHA has sufficient staff to spend this money and get these projects up and running. Thank you um, very much for that question and for the um, concern and understanding that we do need a sufficient infrastructure. I do want to step back first. Um, that 22% figure, I think, comes from 
um, the U.S. Justice Department's figure um, that they put forward in June, and it's, it's a little misleading, and I want to speak to that first, if I may. Okay. Um, so as you know, when we get city funds, we're sort of generally at what I call a cold start. We start design in the year that they become available. Um, as you know, um, we did advance some funds for heating and our federal budget to advance the boiler projects, understanding that we have this cold start every July 1 as new funds get in. We have to get in design. We have to register with the comptroller's office, so on and so forth. But more importantly, I want to point out that actually um, since June, uh, we have committed another almost $30 million in our roof replacement uh, program. The mayor's one, uh, over $1 billion commitment to roofs. And in fact, we are accelerating um, that program over the next several years. There's also over $23 million um, in contingency. OMB uh, wisely requires that all projects are budgeted with a 10% contingency. That's not considered committed unless it's um, needed. So it stands in reserve. Uh, I can also point to $19 million in underruns in uh, roofing projects that have been completed um, and came in under budget. We are retaining those funds for addressing uh, potential change orders in the roofing program and going down the line, and also if there's cost escalation in bids that come in. We have another $15 million in savings across other projects, and this money rolls forward. So the stack can be a little bit uh, misleading. So I, I want to um, pause there for a moment. I also want to mention and remind folks that the mayoral funding is one piece of the money we're moving. We're also moving our $3 billion in FEMA funding. We are moving our capital uh, fund funding from HUD. And we are uh, on this year on pace to commit uh, the requirement is 90% within 24 months to give you also a ballpark of what a norm might be, um, 24 months to commit 90% of the funding. But we aim for 16 to 18 months, and we are on track this year again to meet that deadline. Uh, we're at 75% right now, um, and we expect by the end of the calendar year, uh, 16 months will be 90% committed. So now, back to um, the staffing. Um, the capital uh, division is budgeted for 359 staff persons. We have 44 uh, job openings right now. We have 18 positions, which are staff, we call staff augmentation. We have purchased them from AE firms or CM firms to work in our office and augment what we're doing. We put a lot of our design work out to bid, and we will continue to do that to the extent necessary to move projects on a timely basis. We have no problem doing that. Um, I will say, as you can well imagine, I'm sure you face it yourselves, uh, we do have challenges in recruiting. Um, and. Um, we do the best we can. Um, we outreach to trade groups. Um, I send letters uh, to uh, trade groups and um, uh, um, affinity groups for engineers, architects, project managers. Um, so we're doing everything we can. But as I mentioned, we are also bringing on program managers. As you know, we receive significant one-time funding through the East Harlem zoning and through the mayoral town halls. Uh, and we are going to bring on project management teams, much as we did with Sandy, to uh, administer and oversee these funds that are one-time funding. Okay, a couple of questions uh, on what you talked about. The $19 million in underruns that you described, yes. those are savings that, yes. okay. Where is that money being devoted to? Is that going to expedite uh, the roof work, phase two? Um, we are saving it in reserve. We are expediting, period. Um, OMB has actually agreed to the extent we expedite, they will front the money earlier. Okay. So we have that agreement with them. The $19 million we're holding um, in case we need change orders, or um, as we're seeing, and as you've seen in the P&A, we are seeing market escalation. So we have some flexibility if bids come in reasonably over our estimates. And what about the $15 million in savings? Again, um, similar for other jobs, but not necessarily dedicated to roofs, but they could be used for the boilers or any of other of our um, change order cost overruns in the city portfolio. Okay. And the 44 positions that remain open, um, what positions are those? Can you give us a better sense? I could provide you a list. I don't have it off the top of my head. I will say it ranges from um, 
director of our design department, which I hope we're filling very, very soon, uh, some engineering positions, project management positions, project executive positions, and then there are some administrative as well. Okay, so these all sound like trade specific and anything at the executive level? Right now we are full at the executive level. Okay, and does that also include any of the lower level staff, the day-to-day -day folks that are on the ground at the various developments? Is that a part of it? No, that would come okay. under operations. Okay, so that's operations. Okay, and you specified that because of the uncertainty of the federal government, you don't see a need to hire additional permanent staff. I want to fill the positions we have. I just don't want to grow substantially with an uncertain flow of funds. Okay. Um, the 2017 PNA that was conducted, do you believe that that's an accurate reflection of NYCHA's fiscal, fiscal needs? And you talked about the difference from 2011 to 2017 and the fact that this particular assessment, there was more of a detailed um, analysis that was done in the infrastructure of NYCHA. So things that we did not necessarily look at in 2011 that we're now looking at in 2017. So do you think that this is an accurate reflection of the essential needs of housing? Yes, I think this was a more thorough uh, team, uh, expert team. They brought on, for instance, to look at our elevators. They brought, they had a me mechanical engineer that knows elevator systems, not just a general uh, ge generalist. Um, they went into, um, uh, I'm going to forget the amount, hang on for here, I have some stats. They went into over 20,000 apartments. They. Uh, went up into all the upper floors, 2,200 upper floors, to take space, pay special attention to that. Um, they went uh, into, they inspected the boiler rooms, they did the flyovers of the thermography. Uh, they accounted for things such as uh, when we do our uh, underground steam work, we actually have to dig, this is boring, but we have to dig eight feet instead of a normative three feet. And that's a huge additional expense that wasn't accounted for in the prior PA. So I feel very, very confident that this very well respected team um, did a good job and, stand, and, and importantly, they stand behind it. Okay. So almost 40% of the PA's assessment is attributed to apartment interior upgrades. Yes. Does that mean that NYCHA is going to respond? as it provides all of the necessary work that needs to be done? Are we going to prioritize apartments over the other um, capital needs of NYCHA? Uh, no, so let me step okay. back again. Um, we have, and I certainly have uh, great appreciation for why the work in bathrooms and kitchens is extremely compelling. But we do maintain a discipline of doing the outside of the buildings first, the roofs and the brickwork. To have water infiltrate our apartments after having done kitchens and baths just would not be a wise investment strategy. That said, um, in this five-year plan, we are able to turn some attention, about 40% of our funding over the next five years, to kitchens and baths, and we're able to start making that turn because, for instance, of the investments we've made in roofs through Bond B and the mayor's program, because we are getting our brickwork done, again, with some support from the city. So we are making that turn, but we really want to maintain a discipline that means sure that our, we invest wisely and that we don't put good money in after bad. Okay. I understand that, but I, I also <laughs> think that it's a recognition where the greatest needs are. And I do understand, you know, exterior has to be addressed, facade, roof, boiler, et cetera. But I also understand that the everyday living of NYCHA residents and families is really compelled by how they live inside their apartments. Um, so how much decision-making uh, input from tenants and CCOP and other tenant leaders on the ground are we talking to them to at least find out what their thoughts are on this or are all of the decisions being made at the executive level and to what degree can we do some of this work simultaneous we can walk and chew gum at the same time 
and we can recognize that a lot of this work we can do together. We don't have to do it necessarily in stages, mm -hmm. in phases, and wait for all of the exterior work to be done, and then we deal with the interior. To what extent can we do simultaneous work and start to address some of the individual apartment issues that need to be done now? Well, as I mentioned, we are spending 40% of our federal dollars over the next five years on kitchens and baths. So we Have we started, though? We have um, some, actually, projects are in design and close to construction on that. Um, and, and I will say that's a critical place where we do charrettes with the residents on kitchens and baths, um, colors, um, cabinet choice, hardware choice, flooring choice within a range of what we can offer. Um, in fact, they were at the table when we created our design guidelines for kitchens and baths. Uh, but uh, the rigor and the discipline, as I said, of doing outside going in and heating systems and elevators uh, after the skin continues to be a compelling, logical sequence. And it's all choices, right? We could um, stay with a building after we've done its roof and after we've done its heating system and go into kitchens and baths. That's a decision that we won't do a roof or a heating system at another development. So these are the tensions. Um, we do uh, meet with the RAB um, several times a year to talk about how we're moving forward. Uh, every dollar we invest one place, we don't invest in another place. And it, these are the tensions that we face. Okay. So you said that some of the apartment work is already in design. What's the time frame on design before we begin uh, procurement and construction? Um, I, I'm going to have to get back to you on both. Uh, it's Brooklyn and Sotomayor. Brooklyn, Brook yeah. Ellen, um, and Sotomayor. Okay. And Sotomayor. So we've already identified in terms of priority which developments and which apartments are in design, and then once that happens, the next phase. So NYCHA right. already has a, a list. I'm sure the list is not complete. It's no. probably a work in progress over the next five years. Yes. But you can, at some point, let us know which developments, yes. which apartments have already started with design. Yes, and in fact, if you look at the PNA on our website, you can see where we're planning to invest for kitchens and baths by site. Okay. Um, yeah. Over the next five years? Mm hmm Okay. Okay. And since I'm on apartments so much, um, thoughts on the fact that from 2011 to 2017's PNA, the cost per apartment has gone from about 93,000 mm -hmm. to 181,000. So what are some of the factors that are attributed to uh, this increase and is that a need that obviously NYCHA can meet with a higher cost? Uh, so as I mentioned, um, some of it is the deterioration of the buildings, but two thirds of it is inflation and market escalation. Um, we're seeing it uh, routinely in our bids we are hoping it's leveling off. Whether you're in the public or private sector, this kind of escalation is not sustainable. Um, we are being very careful with our bids, and uh, we have rejected some bids. We want to make sure the industry doesn't think that we will take any and all that come to the door. We need to be responsible. Uh, so we have rejected some bids. On, on the other hand, uh, there's plenty of bids where we know and we test it with um, our peer agencies and the engineering council and that we're suffering the market escalation and we have to have to address it. it okay. It all puts pressure on our funds. And, and I guess looking f moving forward, we also want to make sure that it doesn't continue to grow in terms of that 181. And I know there are some market factors that are simply out of our control. Um, that's the world we live in, but to the degree that we can put a control and some sort of a handle on this, um, what about some of our procurement methods? So you said that you've rejected some of the bids that are coming in, but you know we have to do as much as we can yes, within our controls to make sure that this number does not continue to grow. Absolutely, and um, uh, the, the bid rejection, again, we do it we take a lot of time before we decide to reject, but we've had bids that have come in at 50% over our estimate with no reasonable basis for it, and we cannot send a signal to the industry that we will take any bid that comes in, and it is not an appropriate use of the funding. Um, it's not a good fiduciary decision if we can find no basis for that escalation. On the other hand, um, 
We are looking at, uh, you mentioned procurement. We are heavily regulated, as you know, by both the state and the federal government. Um, and uh, some of those regulations are uh, absolutely appropriate for public oversight of use of public funds. We, are, we have looked at how we can streamline um, working with OMB and the Comptroller Office for post-bid, getting our um, design and construction contracts approved more quickly. Um, I have met only uh, a couple weeks ago with our own procurement department over how we might move our vendor clearance forward more easily. Um, I've met with industry groups to get their feedback on how we could improve the process. We have revised a number of our contract documents and continue to do so, so that they're more straightforward and reflect the industry to the extent we can. Um, but we are open to continued dialogue about that, obviously. Okay. Um, so over the next five years, on the exterior work, we're looking at about $3.6 billion. And interior apartment work over the next five years is about $635 million. Um, if those numbers are accurate, is it possible moving forward that we could see more investments made towards interiors? Can we get to a billion? You know, as I said, um, we got 400 million here. Well, under federal funding, um, I just want to make sure we're all looking. I'm, I'm looking at about 270 million for brickwork and local law 11. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at 240 million for bathrooms and kitchens. And then you'll look down and you'll see 407 million proposed for comprehensive modernization. That would include kitchens, baths, stairwells. So again, we've been making that uh, turn towards those kinds of investments. And it's always a choice. We can choose to do more bathrooms and kitchens. We will do fewer roofs and we will do fewer boilers. That's, it, that's the tension we come down to. Okay. Well, no, I, I just want to make sure that there's a, a recognition that, again, based on the P&A that was done, mm -hmm. there is a priority that must be given to interior. Um, and while I recognize exterior is important, we care about the roof and the boiler yeah. because that will have a detrimental impact on individual apartments, particularly those in the high-rise buildings. Um, but I don't want there to appear to be a shift of focusing more on exterior and not interior because the PNA 40% has indicated interior is a priority. So that's why I'm asking if we can invest more over the next five years and what this council can do to be supportive because I think if you talk to residents on the ground and you're speaking to all of the resident leaders, they will acknowledge that you know residents have not had upgrades in their apartments since they lived in their apartments from the beginning of time. Um, and there has not been serious investments. Not taking away priority from roofs mm -hmm. and boilers, because that is important. I just want to raise the level of priority for interior. That's all. Thank you. OK. Um, my last question before I turn it over to our chair is I wanted to understand with the interior apartment work, is that eligible through city funds as well? Because I that know we have. Cap that would be capitally eligible, yes. Capitally eligible. OMB approved. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Um, because I know as a council, some of us are being asked by our tenant leaders to provide funding for apartment uh, upgrades. So we certainly wanted to make sure that it is city eligible. Okay. I'll have more questions. I'll get off apartment okay. and interiors and go to other topics. But I did want to turn this over to my uh, co chair, Council Member Ampri Samuel. So for just a point of clarification, just to understand, in, um, can you explain how RAB is part of the dialogue and conversation? Well, so just uh, explain. Um, sure, in that. Um, how RAB is structured. RAD um, raises, can leverage funding. Because it's on the Section 8 stream, it's allowed. RAB. RAB. Oh, you I'm sorry. The I'm the sorry. Participation the Resident Advisory the Board. Um, we present annually our draft capital plan to them um, for a comment, and we come back a second and or third time to um, hear their comments on it. So when you mentioned um, a residents participating in even the design guide, is this the RAB 
or is it a different uh, uh, no, um, resident structure? It was residents from Brook Ellen, and I'm not sure where else we pulled them. And I, James, I don't know if you know. It would be specific to projects that are planned. So during the design process, it's design. the resident leadership at, at the development. The design guidelines. OK. All right. So um, the resident panel that were here prior to this testimony um, mentioned their own ideas. And um, they were, I wrote down a quote um, where it, the, the resident spoke to um, really speaking directly to the residents about the actual needs within the mm -hmm. developments and the, um, in their apartments because they're the ones that actually know. Um, what level of involvement did the resident leaders have when um, they were going out doing the inspections and actually pulling together the PNA? Um, I Individual buildings as well as the RAB or CCOP. Okay, so I can I do know CCOP and RAB did not have involvement in the PNA inspections. Um, James, I don't know if residents at the sites did. No, the management and the superintendent at the development were involved in the PNA um, evaluations. Just the superintendents. And the development staff. And the development staff. So they wasn't like a like a, the resident leader or someone like a designated. Um, person that lives at each development that walked around with them at no, all? No, they were not. OK, because we received, and I can just for example, we received um, a very detailed um, document from Cephalo Houses. And it was um, very similar to the um, PNA, but from a resident perspective. When they listed, they went through each apartment. They did a, um, sophisticated surveys and um, work with um, advocacy groups and um, have a list of the actual needs for the developments from a resident perspective. And so um, have you ever, um, were you aware of this document we at all or we, something similar? No, we weren't, but we would be happy to sit with them and review it and compare it to our PNA. OK, OK. Because those are, those are helpful because um, just a line of questions from my colleague, um, looking at what's listed and hearing from the residents as to what's actually happening in their apartments, um, I would hate for us to continue to move forward and it doesn't really address the concerns of what's actually happening. And um, I always say over and over and over that resident feedback, resident input, resident involvement is critical at every stage. And this is just another level of, of that need. So uh, we try to make wise decisions. We're happy to meet with them and hear what they have said. But we also have a fiduciary responsibility around deploying the funds. And it is this compelling logic um, but we're happy to sit down and, and talk over any differences we may have based on our PNA and their daily life expects, experience, absolutely. Okay. So since you did mention RAD with a yes, D sorry. in your, in your um, opening testimony, how will NextGen 2.0, um, and you can use RAD as the first example, but I would like to get a sense of the different um, development um, deals or plans in the portfolio overall, but how will NextGen 2.0 um, or the development plans finance the actual capital repairs at NYCHA? So I am. Um, so can you just take us through? Yeah, the actually, stages? I can't take you through the update to NextGen. It's not in my portfolio. I obviously understand the themes of it. As so, the, instead of speaking yeah. theoretically, then so take us through the plans that you, the development deals that you have on the table now within okay. your portfolio that you can actually speak to. Again, I'm not in real estate, but because I am aware of what's going on, I can speak broadly, if that's okay. Um, so in our um, development deals of 50-50, um, the funding that comes in through the um, present value of the ground lease, 100% um, of it goes to, about well, 50% of it to date has, gone, has been pledged to improvements at what I call the host site. We are looking at making that 100% of the proceeds. Um, previously, we were concerned. So what does that mean? So, so you said, so name the development again? Um, this Holmes, for instance, is the first one that's underway. Okay. And 
Uh, so out of the 50, so it's a 50-50 deal. Right. And out of the proceeds, how much of it will go to homes? Um, at this point, um, the full amount of the ground lease, we expect 25 million, and we are working with them to identify, um, again, the P&A needs, what can be done with that, and moving through it to have a- So what are the P&A needs for homes? Um, I'd have to take a That's minute okay. to, to look. Okay. It's- uh, 47 million, according to the 2017. We can get this specific number. I know in meetings we've had with the developer representing CPD, we have looked at, <clears throat> Holmes actually is in the mayor's roofing initiative. We will continue that. Um, we're looking at bricks, windows, uh, maybe a, an alternative means of cladding the building instead of bricks, consistent with what the developer proposes to do at, their, at, the, at the new building. Um, but we can get you more information. They're looking it up. That'll be helpful. So what what we're just trying to get a sense of is looking at the P and A, mm -hmm. looking at the needs, like just pulling out a specific development, and looking at the plan or strategy around um, that particular development, and seeing line by line if what you're projecting um, you'll be able to receive in revenue will actually address the needs of that development. And if it doesn't, if it falls short, what other funding mechanisms are you looking okay. to address those needs? Because that's what we, so um, that's what the folks at NYCHA need to get a sense of you're actually doing and what's happening. Because if it's just talk, it's just talk. Okay. But if we can sit here and go like just line by line as to what you're actually doing, then that gives us a better sense of, you know, you're, you're actually working on something and, and we can see it. Well, let me speak generally because um, I'm not sure that line by line, we're not really prepared to speak line by line now. We're in the process of figuring it out, but this is, this is okay. the approach. Um, leverage the funds to the maximum extent possible for the repairs at that host site. As I mentioned, we know they need roofs. We are not gonna be short-sighted. Um, we will continue to, we will actually, we're gonna bring homes forward in the, in the mayoral's roofing initiative in order to time it with the other repairs that would happen at homes. To the extent we don't cover all of the P&A costs, and there's some hope we would cover a substantial portion of it, uh, we don't walk away from homes. It remains um, part of our capital planning process. Okay. What specific funding sources is NYCHA considering for PACT? And how do the programs function? So can you just give us a, like a, a idea of the full program itself? Um, I understand that, okay, so I, I'm trying to think of a way to, to, to get some um, like clarity and not just. So PACT would be RAD or the state in unfunded units that we're putting on the Section 8 stream, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which allows, that allows it to be lever leverage um, borrowing to do everything that's necessary um, at that site. And thereafter, being on the Section 8 stream, they're also able to fund a capital reserve account, as we cannot do in public housing side of things. But most, as you know, most owners would do that. And so they're able to um, project long-term needs and fund it on an annual basis in the capital reserve. Okay, so how about this? What's the role of HPD and HDC in your planning right now? That comes under the real estate department. I have nothing to do with those conversations, council member, chair. Okay, so there's no one that can speak to like term sheets or what type of term sheets they're using now or what? No, it's not connected to the, um, the, the, the work I do with the P&A and capital improvements. Okay, all right. And the only reason why I had that line of questioning is because just trying to get a sense of what the city is, um, how the city is looking overall at, um, uh, NYCHA in its housing preservation and it's preserving its units mm -hmm. and looking to see what this administration is, um, how this administration is planning their um, like tax credits and funding resources um, 
um, the same way they're planning all these other ho affordable housing deals that's taking place across the city. Mm -hmm. And since public housing and what, what we see is happening at NYCHA is, um, should be plan the same exact way that they're looking at other affordable housing deals. And so it would be helpful to see how um, this administration is utilizing its resources for public housing specifically and see where there can be some cost savings at all. Um, I'll hold off there. Who's next? Gredenchik. Council Member Gredenchik. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Chairs. Um, good morning. Still morning? I think it's still morning. Still morning, okay. Uh, it's a long ride in on the F train today. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, we've had discussions, um, the Council's had with Governor Cuomo over design build. And while I know that design build wouldn't fit everything mm -hmm. that you need to do, um, how much money, have you made any estimates of how much money the NYCHA could save, uh, in theory at least, if we had design build available to us on an unlimited basis? Uh, to be honest with you, we haven't focused on the financial savings. We've focused on the um, delivery savings, the schedule savings. Um, well, time is money, so that's good. That, <laughs> very true, very true. Um, uh, and just to be clear, um, the design build authority we did get from the state was limited. We can't use it across our portfolio, and we are still working with HUD, and actually I'm very encouraged by recent conversations with HUD about getting their some movement so that we could use di design build, because we need approval from both sides. You need approval from both sides. H yes. Have they, has HUD given you a reason why they wouldn't, why this... You know, Does I just, it it, it's, it's a matter of um, long-standing regs. Um, I think they go back to, my understanding um, is they go back to a concern that the uh, designer and contractor don't sort of get in cahoots and up the cost of the construction through the design. Um, but that's, that's an outdated perspective. Plenty of people do design build. Um, and in fact, we are getting ready to procure a consultant to help, if we get the authority, to help us um, bid and administer design build in a way that is cost effective and efficient. Well, I'm gonna to continue to advocate for it next time we see the governor. Thank you. Um, ooh, that was fast. Wait till you get to the parks committee, you're gonna be in trouble. Um, just one more question. Um, if I wrote a check, which cleared today for $32 billion, how long would it take you to do all this work? I know it, it, it just, we're talking about years and years, it's just the, the prospect is so staggering. Mm -hmm. um, but I know the MTA has a five-year capital plan. They also have a, you know, the, on top of that, another plan, which we're still getting details on. But do, do you at NYCHA th think of it in five-year plan, a 10-year plan? Because the numbers are just so staggering. Right, I think we, we you're absolutely right. I, I, when I arrived here a couple years ago, I said, well, if we spend all the money on roofs that we're spending, how much of the need will we take care of? And that was before the mayor's announcement. And I was like, oh my God. Um, so we do look at it partially by components. So with the mayor's funding on roofs, we know that when we're done with that program, we should be in, back into life cycle replacement, move on. Um, we know that with the money we're getting, if we get the money from the state on boilers, we have about a $300 million need left we can start thinking about how we, we um, address that. We have generally planned in five-year in increments, it's what HUD, um, it's the HUD cycle, but we are now, in fact, putting together a 10-year plan to take that longer look, which is actually more appropriate for capital planning, to see when can we finish boilers, when can we finish elevators, how much of kitchens and baths we can do. In terms of how quickly we could spend $32 billion, um, or even slightly less than that, I think we also have to be aware that um, at some point the market is saturated. And so at some point, putting more money on the street is not going to be an answer. And that's just something we have to continue to judge if we would ever have the good fortune of uh, reaching that problem. That would be some good problem to it have. Would. All right. Thank you, Madam Chairs. Thank you for your answers, Ms. Goddard. 
I just want to very quickly follow up on the council member's question as it relates to design build with no limits and no conditions, right? Um, you talked about delivery savings in terms of time frame. So in terms of design, how much time would you anticipate saving and would that be by project type? So would it be all projects or certain capital projects where you anticipate design build authority would be beneficial? Um, so right now we've looked at boilers and elevators because that was this, uh, what the state money was funding and the legislation allowed it for at least the boilers. Um, but you, to your question, yes, it would differ depending upon the nature of the project. Um, so in uh, design build, we thought that, um, just a minute please, on a heating system that we could uh, shrink schedules that were three to five years in total design construction through to completion to uh, a year and a half to two years. So, you know, cut somewhere between a year or two off the schedule. I will say in the absence of design build on the mayor's heating schedule, we also made a commitment to move forward and cut our design time in half, and we did from 12 months to six months. And this relates back to my saying, we're gonna look at the industry and tie our, our schedules and uh, the evaluation of our schedules to what are industry norms. Okay, what about elevators? Do you have a projected time frame on that? I really care about elevators. Yeah, I, I don't, but we, we, can, we will do it because um, we are still talking with the state. In fact, elevators is a perfect place for design build because it's virtually design build. But we can get that to you. Okay, and also on boilers too, would you be yes. able to get that info as well? Okay, okay, thank you. Council Member Powers. Yep, thank you. Just to follow up on Council Member, I'll take Council Member Grenchik's uh, time left over or, or not left over. Um, I didn't hear a specific reasonable time estimate though. I thought you said maybe we're looking at 10 years now. Is that to say if money was, and I heard the saturation point, but if that money was available, that a reasonable expectation would be 10 years to do the work that's needed here? No. So, so what is a reasonable expectation? I don't, I honestly can't sit here Without having thought about that, I can't sit here and tell you what that is, but this has been decades in the making, and I think it is probably a few decades in the um, solution. To, if, if it's for total cost, to total money and then cost, staggering. Um, and the $450 million that you referenced in your uh, testimony that we know is still owed by the state, can you yes. give us an update on that money? Um, so we actually talked to uh, the OMB, state OMB and state budget office reached out to us a couple weeks ago. Uh, we had been very close to a grant agreement before the, the governor's executive order, um, but they made it clear that the money would not flow until the monitor was appointed that under the consent decree. So as you well know, we are now a little bit in limbo on that. In the meantime, we had put these lists together a couple years ago, and we're taking the time to go out now and about, you know, redo our estimates um, so that we're ready to go when the money's available. And then uh, two more questions, and then I'll hand it back. The, um, in the assessment, the, the, in the PNA, I noticed that you, you referenced this in your testimony, but a number of costs have gone up. Elevators have gone up 5,293 percent. Yes. Which is remarkable in a six-year yes. period. And uh, mechanical and electrical has gone up 2,617%. 2, 2, Roofs actually have gone down 4%. Yes. But why, you mentioned this, but how is it possible those are so much higher today than six years ago? Well, um, the, uh, first let me say on a little bit of good news, it does show what concentrated investment can do, right, on roofs. But on elevators in particular, uh, this team had a much more expert engineering team looking at our elevators, and so the figure from 2011 was not yeah. enough. It wasn't sufficient. By a lot. By quite a bit, quite a bit, yes. So what confidence do we have that the numbers today are then the right um, Because AECOM STV did take the effort to have an engineer, have an engineering team who are specifically expert in elevators, um, 
and given the reputation of these, these companies and that they're willing to stand behind it, and they've stood behind it as we've um, vetted these numbers, um, I have confidence that they're appropriate. Okay, and then last question. You mentioned uh, both the um, uh, regulations that, uh, the, from the federal level and the state level. I'm sure okay. there's some at the city level too that, but no, okay, no city level, okay, that, uh, that, that make the work, that, that add, you know, complication or sure. consideration in terms of doing the work you're doing. Can you tell us what are the, can, can you just lay those, some of those real uh, ones out and, and any that you are seeking or NYCHA is seeking relief from or mm -hmm. has asked for relief from mm -hmm. in order to do this work in a more expedited or cheaper manner? Because yeah. I think as we approach, uh, well, I think we are at crisis level in right. terms of doing this work and we're hearing decades and 30 something billion dollars to, I'm turning my phone off, sorry, uh, to, uh, to do this work. Um, we, we'd, it would also be an important moment to uh, discuss what are the, what are the regulations that's, that you, you see as mm -hmm. interfering in mm -hmm. the goals of doing this quick and, yep. and affordable? So um, I don't always like to focus on procurement in that a lot of the effort in procurement is simply a public advertising period. And I, you know, that is not a huge effort. Um, after that, um, and I will say on the city side, yes, we, um, after we procure, for every architectural contract we do, then for the construction management contract, then for the construction contract. Each of those times we go through an OMB process. OMB is very responsive for approving it. Then we go to the comptroller's office for approval. We are trying to work with them to um, make sure we deliver packages that are in the form they want and that they turn them around expeditiously. Um, I, so I'll step back and say on the city there are steps that um, do add time. Uh, I've met with our own procurement people. I think we could maybe speed up some of our internal processes. And we're talking about where the sticking points, and cr I've created tracking so I can track that. Um, on boilers, we got a board vote, and maybe we do this more broadly, to um, allow me to contract and report to the board on what I've contracted so that we don't have to wait for the, the board cycle. Um, but I think that procurement in and of itself often gets a bad rap that is overblown. I will say though, to design, build, um, and the sort of outdated state and federal regulations in terms of new procurement methods, that is something we'd like to see loosened up. And even on the state level, advocacy for design build broadly would be very helpful. Got it, thank you. Thank you to the chairs. We've been joined by Councilmember Jonai as well as Councilmember Salamanca. Councilmember Salamanca. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first, I want to thank you for this uh, detailed list of, of capital needs in my district, uh, District 17. So, I in my district to address all the capital needs, it's 1.2 billion dollars. Total population, 15,520. Therefore, an average per person is $77,965 to fix these there for every individual person. And I have 6,668 units. When you average that out with the $1.2 billion, that comes out to $181,471 per unit. That is unbelievable. And you know, I really cannot just blame this current administration, even though I think that this current administration could do a better job in uh, providing better on-site management to avoid some of these big capital uh, um, mm -hmm. disasters that's happening. I do blame past administrations who, what they have done is kick the can down the road to allow us to get to a $31.8 billion capital need in the city of New York. Just, I just want that to sit in. Um, in my district, I know that um, there are some issues and some concerns. Uh, there are certain uh, projects that are really affecting the quality of life of my constituents. And I think that some of these projects are, are urgent and can be fast-tracked. And um, I have, for example, Jackson houses, the, uh, the transmitters. Mm -hmm. are constantly falling apart, now are turning off. So they're, they're, they're surviving off of backup generators. Mm -hmm. And in the last couple of weeks, the backup generators 
I'm not working either. And so what is your plan to address the basic need of electricity in these buildings? When the electricity goes out, that means that the light in the hallways goes out, that means that the light in the apartments goes out, and most importantly, the elevators are going out. So can you please explain to me what is your plan to address the basic need of electricity in JAXA houses? Okay, I'm gonna ask James to respond to that. So we are aware of Jackson Houses. It's a step up with the Transformers. Um, it's actually going to begin design within the next six months, and it would be planned for a capital upgrade next year. You, you said the Transformers will be? Well, right now, there's a, it, it, Jackson requires a step up. So um, it, it's currently got a um, Transformer that went down. Um, we are, we are let, let's be clear here, because I, get a, I don't get correct information many mm -hmm. times in these hearings uh, compared to the information that I get from Brian or from Vito. My understanding is that these transformers were delivered. The first batch was delivered. There was one transformer that was broken, right. and they were sent back, and that these transformers were re-delivered. Therefore, these transformers should be there currently, and that work should be getting done as we speak. And it's my understanding that before the end of December, these transformers will be up and running. But now you're telling me that it's going to take six months to get that work done. So um, James was speaking to the permanent solution being overseen by capital. But you're absolutely right that on the operation side, they have delivered the, the transformers. But we were talking about the permanent um, response. So the, these transformers that have been delivered are going to be installed. It's going to be a temporary solution to actually resolve the entire issue with electricity in Jackson houses would take up to six months? Um, we are um, designing a new system. So it will be designed and construct, cons construction would start next year, but it's a new system. All right. I just feel that we just get pieces and pieces of information instead of NYCHA being honest from the very beginning and giving us the whole entire picture. We're, we're happy to talk with you uh, additionally. My, uh, my, my last question, Madam Chair, if, if I may, just one last question. Uh, roofs. Um, there are some buildings in, uh, for example, 1471 Watson Avenue, you know, for a population of 163 people, 96 units, they have an, almost a $20 million need, capital need, in these buildings. Um, in this last budget, I, there was a, a cost of about $2.8 million, something in that price range to fix the roof. Uh, I was uh, negotiating to get some of those capital dollars allocated, uh, and NYCHA turned around. I, I was trying to get the, that, that money allocated in the last budget, but in conversations with NYCHA and the council, we was informed that 1471 Watson was going to be added to the RAT, to the new batch of RAT uh, projects that you were going to apply. Did that happen? Is there a list of RAD projects? And if so, how can we get access to that list that NYCHA, the list of developments that NYCHA applied for? Um, yes, we do have a list of what has been applied for to HUD. Um, that's not my department, but yes, we have it. We do have it. And how do we get access to that list? Um, we'll take that back to the real estate department. All right, and so when will I get a response? I don't think it should take too long. I think it should be uh, beginning of next week, tomorrow. I, I'm not sure. All right. I look forward to getting access to that list. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the last um, hearing that we had, we asked for a list of all of the um, plans, all the development plans. We asked for the 50-50. We asked for the 100% affordable, uh -huh. as well as the RAD. Okay. So it would be great to have that. But we... But we did ask for it in the last hearing and haven't received it yet. In reference to RAD and its conversions, are there any plans to um, or need to relocate residents at all? Again, that's being handled by the real estate department, but knowing what we've done to date and knowing in general how RAD proceeds, um, the rehab that's been done to date hasn't required relocation, sometimes hospitality suites while work is being done in the apartment, but not permanent relocation, no. And with those uh, developments, um, have you already started the process of having the formal uh, sit-down meetings with the residents, and have they been a part of the reviews of the scope of work at all? Um, I know you covered that in the hearing with the real estate department, and I, that, that's in their bailiwick. I would not know. Okay. Oh, 
we've been joined by Majority Leader Lori Combo as well as Council Member Richie Torres. And next, Council Member Joe Thank you, Chair. Can you help me understand so I can go back to my district, the 6,700 residents, and explain to them that the basic of services will be preserved and corrected within a reasonable amount of time. And this is just heat, hot water, mm -hmm. um, no leaking roofs, no mold, no lead paint. What is the time frame that you're ready to commit to when it comes to protecting the most vulnerable citizens of New York to assure that they have the basic of services? Um. I certainly share the value statement of providing quality, clean, safe housing for every single one of our residents. As I sort of alluded to, or actually said to uh, Council Member Powers, in terms of the capital side and the $32 billion need we have, I am not ready to provide a reliable, uh, estimate for how long it would take us to work through all of those capital improvements. And frankly, we don't have the funding to do all those capital improvements. Uh, our pledge is to use the resources we do have intelligently, as efficiently as possible, and to continue to uh, put everything on the table in terms of how we can raise uh, resources to address these issues. But I do not have an answer for when this can be done and how it can be done with the resources we currently have. I don't even know how to respond to that, let alone how the residents of NYCHA should respond to that comment that we're working on it, just don't have an answer for you. For the basic, and I'm not talking about upgrades in kitchens and bathrooms and uh, paint my apartment and uh, improve the conditions that I'm living in. We're talking about heat, hot water, no leaks. This is the richest city in the world. And the 400,000 most vulnerable New Yorkers have been given empty promises your $32 billion deficit, and I agree with the federal judge that the half measures and half commitments, and that's exactly what we're getting today, is half answers. I don't know when, I don't know how I can commit, and you're gonna go back to, well, this is decades in the making, and it'll take decades to correct. How do you look at those people in that audience and tell them that 20 years from now, maybe we'll get to your apartment Maybe we'll get to your roof, your boiler. Just maybe your son or your daughter or your grandchildren will not be subjected to lead and mold. So, Council Member, um, let me step back a minute. And uh, I was speaking to my purview, which is capital improvements, but um, speaking to the agency as a whole uh, on heat and hot water. We have made a commitment. We are, the operations does have um, more crews, more expertise. Um, they have more temporary boilers in case they need to deploy them. And the GM and the chair's pledge is to respond rapidly. Um, to date, I believe we've um, generally been able to address um, outages generally within 24 hours and we want to maintain that record. Uh, in terms of lead and mold, um, there is a Healthy Homes Department that's been created, and that is their focus, and that is what they'll be working on. I, I'm sorry, I was speaking to the, the apartment improvements, the boilers and the roofs. As I did mention on some of those key items on roofs, with the mayor's money, we do believe that at the end of the roofing initiative, we will be back to a regular steady state of life cycle replacement of roofs. With the uh, state and city money and federal money and EPCs for boilers, we've covered all but about 300 million of it and we continue to plan about how we can address that remaining need in the boilers. Um, 
And the work we have done on those systems has allowed, as I've mentioned before, us to take a, a, a significant turn in the, in the capital plan, uh, such that 40% of the funding over the next five years will be going to kitchens and baths. I'm only reacting to the comment that you made, that this is, is decades in the making and it'll take decades to correct. And, and that's, genera that's a generation. And You're, we're, you, you made a comment that it'll take a generation for the issues of NYCHA to be addressed. That's unbelievable, unacceptable, and out, outside of RAD and PACT, mm -hmm. this administration has come up with no other proposal on the table that'll help generate that revenue. They don't have a generation to wait. And no commitment or lack of commitment as to a, a time frame that you could be held accountable to is an injustice. I don't know how else to say it. With all due respect, and um, I don't say this lightly, um, our residents deserve to have everything, as I said, safe and healthy. I do not say this lightly, but I don't, we don't have $32 billion. And it would be irresponsible of me to project when I thought I could have $32 billion worth of repairs, capital repairs done. That is not to say any of us are happy or comfortable at all with that status. Well, the proposed plans that are on the table for the, to raise the revenue are unacceptable. There is no, the old, you, NYCHA will not reach financial stability ever. That's what you're saying today. No, I didn't say that. I just said it, it, it's, a, it's a daunting challenge and we don't have the resources now, correct? I did say that. We started off in the last year with numbers that jumped from $15 billion to $32 billion in a single year. Those are the projections of the capital assessment needs less than a year ago. They went from 15 billion, they're now at 32 billion, and a year from now, I dare imagine what the capital needs are going to be. Well, uh, I'm not sure um, what f comparison you're, you're making. The five years ago, the need was 16.1, 16 billion, right? I stand right. corrected, uh, 16 okay. billion. Five, five years ago. Um, and I think it's important to note, as I, as I mentioned, that two-thirds of the increase is not a change in the condition of our buildings. It is inflation and market escalation. And uh, I think we can reasonably hope that that trend is not going to continue because it's not sustainable for any market. I have no further questions. I have no other comments except that it's a sad day for New Yorkers and it really is a injustice and a tragedy for NYCHA residents that we can't do better for them. Thank you, Councilmember Joni. Uh, just a very quick question as I uh, get to my next colleague. Um, in the case of some of the individual developments where there are temporary boilers and other temporary equipment in place, uh, the design process is being expedited from 12 months to six months, as one example of Andrew Jackson that Councilmember Salamanca talked about. In addition to that, are there other measures that NYCHA can put in place to expedite these particular projects? Um, I think it speaks volumes to obviously the challenge, um, but whatever we can do as a city to expedite some of these projects, is that something that we are looking at? So 12 months to six months is great, yeah. right? So I commend you for that. Um, but for a lot of the developments where we have temporary measures in place, and I've, my district is right across the street from Andrew Jackson, and there's a senior center in the development, so we've experienced over the summer a couple of disruptions of service where we had no air conditioning in the senior center, the power was cut, the elevators were cut. Um, so what other measures can we do to expedite some of these projects at particular developments where we do have the temporary systems in place? So I just want to be clear, there are two kinds of um, issues going on here. Jackson is on the electrical side. Um, right. And so uh, again, um, we will try and expedite the design, even if it may mean it has to go out of house to be done. On the mayor's boilers, that's where we've been able, heating plants, we've been able to cut the six months. As I mentioned before, we, um, 
we have had, I didn't mention today, but we, did, we have had uh, great cooperation from the Department of Buildings about meeting us with that design process um, earlier on so that when plans got submitted, they were ready to go. Uh, we have a commitment on boiler heating plants from DEP. Uh, we give them advance notice. They will pri prioritize their inspections and certifications. Uh, OMB, uh, we move through OMB very quickly, and we've been meeting with the controller's office about whether they can take things um, electronically and file more easily. Internally, as I mentioned, we did away. We amended our own rules so that I don't have to go to the board ahead of awarding a contract. I can go to report the awarding of a heating plant contract. And that's something we'll look at for other things, too. Um, and as I said, we remain open to other ideas and suggestions. Okay, so those conversations are actively happening now with OMB, DEP, DOB, and all the relevant agencies that have oversight, approval, permit process, approval, et cetera, where these agencies can help push this process along. We already correct? have, yes, we have commitments from them. Oh, and yes, let me not forget the controller's office as well. Yeah. We need them to expedite approving and registering these contracts. Yes. Right? Okay. Thank you. Um, next, we'll have Council Member Ayala followed by Council Member Rosenthal. Good afternoon. My question is really around the senior housing portfolio. Is there any priority given to capital, project imp uh, capital improvement projects for developments that house seniors specifically? Um, it may come into play if there's really um, a, a health or safety issue. Um, but we do generally stick to the issues of operational data um, and uh, whether something has parts accessible and its useful life. And I, I think that's, that's kind of the problem that I, you know, I've been um, encountering is I have seniors that are sitting for hours sometimes in the lobby waiting for elevators, to, you know, repair technicians mm -hmm. to come mm -hmm. and repair the elevators. And I wonder, is there like a tracking system that NYCHA has that alerts whenever it's a building that has a special needs population, right? Because I applaud the idea of building senior housing, but the fact that they would construct it in a way that did not allow for social service workers to be in the buildings and for that supportive, um, mm -hmm. comprehensive planning that needed to go into them a lot now leaves a whole entire building of vulnerable people, you know, alone um, to figure it out. If you live in a regular building, you might have a neighbor that will help you out, right? But you, you have 17-story buildings that are, you know, occupied primarily by older adults that cannot possibly walk up the stairs. And the fact that seniors are waiting for hours and hours and hours, I wonder, like, even if we can't fast track um, the capital needs projects, for example, if we have an elevator repair work that needs to be done, is there a, tr a tracking mechanism that alerts the technicians to like, this is a special needs population, you need to get there quickly. And that, that also, you know, relates to people with uh, disabilities, right. people, you know, with wheelchairs. I have right. a cousin that lives at Chelsea and she has to go for dialysis. She's in a wheelchair. Oftentimes she's in front of the building and this is, you know, an inclement weather. Um, during the summer, during the winter, and it happens consistently, and I just wonder what is, what is NYCHA's you know, contingency plan? Um, I can't speak in great detail because that's on the operations side of our shop, but I do know that yes, there is an alert system, and yes, there are flags that identify um, buildings and apartments that have uh, persons with um, issues in, in mobility when the elevators are out. Who and who would be able to tell us what that system looks like? Um, Kathy Pennington, the EVP for uh, operations, and she has an elevator unit that works with her. Is it possible that she would share that information with us at the council? Of course. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ayala. Next, we'll have Council Member Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Torres. Great. Thank you. Um, I really want to uh, dig into procurement a little bit. Is that part of your bailiwick? I have to deal with procurement, yes. Are you guys, uh, is NYCHA participating in the passport system? Yes. To, and which phase are you in? I don't know what you mean by phase, council member. Are you participating at the same pace that the rest of the city is, or are you just starting? Oh, no, we're fully on board. What does fully on board mean? I mean are, are all your contractors yes. qualified? They get pre-qualified um, generally as they come in on a bid, but we, all of our contracts, all our contractors do go through Passport. And then if, you know, so if they've never worked with us before, we encourage them to get filed with Passport ahead of bidding, so there's, 
you know, it's efficient. If a contract's awarded, that's when the, v, the vendor you, name. Thank you. What do you think the power of Passport is for your, to improve procurement for NYCHA? Um, I think, I mean, it's really a checks and balance. I, it, I don't know that it improves um, procurement. It's a check and balance. Um, it provides critical information about the history of the contractor. Um, I don't see it as our, our experience, to what I know, it in and of itself is not a hurdle. Is not? Is not a hurdle. A hurdle? No. Okay. So um, I'd encourage you to sit down with Dan Simon at the Mayor's Office of Contracts. Okay. Um, speaking as a former chair of the Committee on Contracts, the power of Passport is um, multi-level, but there are a couple of great benefits that I think might be beneficial to NYCHA. One is that um, it roots out more effectively contractors that have ripped off the city in the past so that you're less likely to sign a contract mm -hmm. with them again. Mm -hmm. So that's one really powerful yes. part of it. Another really powerful part, if you're integrated into the passport system, is that it changes the payment timing for uh, people who have contracts with the city. And the hope is that if we start paying people on time, and not two years later, that the cost of doing business for the city will come down. So let me um, clarify what I meant by my comment. Um, when I said it, it serves a very useful purpose, I meant just that, that about rooting, rooting out the, the, the bad doers. And so I don't see that as a hurdle. So I, I, was, I thought you maybe were asking me if I thought Passport got in the way, and it, I don't think it does. As to payment, I do want to really be clear that, um, and I've paid attention to this, um, we have a very good track record of 30-day payment. Huh. Um, so one of the other really big problems that I noticed when I did a deep dive into procurement for cameras uh, in my district, uh, which was during my first year on the council, I don't think we've ever met, I uh, came to understand that the procurement um, system was a really top-down uh, program where people at the top wanted something to be done and um, it sort of filtered down through middle management um, to get done. And one of the things that you know we've discovered um, working with the Mayor's Office of Contracts is that the most successful contracts are one that come from the bottom up, that you get the least amount of fraud, waste, and abuse if you have the actual users um, for whatever product it's going to be, uh, be very clear about what they need, mm -hmm. what they're looking for. And I, I offer that as advice. I don't know if that's something you guys would consider doing, but. I say all of this because when I look at a $32 billion shortfall, of course it's a hellacious number and no one can wrap their head around it, but I would assume that you would be doing two things, is fixing procurement in a meaningful way um, at the same time that you figure out a variety of financing mechanisms to get where you want to go. And I just, I've heard sort of, um, you know, brief statements, oh yeah, we're fixing procurement. But I think for this committee it would be great, and certainly for um, Chair Gibson, um, to hear perhaps around budget time what your specific plans are to fix procurement. Um, my experience has been that there's a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse. And, um, you know, it would just strike me that that could, you could chip away at that 32 billion, maybe bring it down to 30, and that's not a bad thing. The second question I'm gonna then give back to the chair. Um, one thing I noticed uh, as you have um, looked at the physical needs statement is the disconnect is between the financing and each of the um, buildings that 
um, each of the NYCHA buildings. So in other words, I think people would be more trustful of a program where you could see for each building which financing mechanism you expect mm -hmm. to use in order to get to the dollar amount of what's needed at that building. And I don't know if you have that behind closed doors, but that would be helpful to know because uh, otherwise nothing really, you can't cross check or see if anything adds up. Right. I mean, it's very difficult to understand, you know, when you, when H, when you say that, you know, you'll be looking to use HPD term sheets, that's just as much a mystery to the public as anything else that does not explain how you get to the the need. So for example, one of mine is 154, I'm just looking at my sheet of paper, yeah. West 84th Street, or Amsterdam Houses, $196 uh, million, dollars, or $197 million of need uh, from soup to nuts. So it would be great to know which financing mechanism you're planning on using. Is it packed? Is it RAD? Is it mm -hmm. Section mm -hmm. 8? Which, or which combination of yeah. things yeah. do you expect to use there in order to get to the 197 million and explain how in using those new financing tools you're going to make sure that Amsterdam Houses is fixed first before any new building would go up or a shift of air rights, whatever it might be. So um, that really uh, relates to, I think, the hearing you had last week on the real estate department, and I understand from um, Chair Empry Samuel that you've asked for some of that information, um, and the agency agreed to give it to you. Uh, in terms of capital, what? Which, I understand that that was at requested last week. What's in the RAD pipeline? What's in the PAC pipeline? That's not my my department. Well, the so, but I understand I asked, it was asked I, for. I'm less interested about whether or not it's in your department. Um, you should be asking these questions. I would imagine you would want the answer to that Absolutely. question. Absolutely. It needs to be coordinated. Um, and uh, I understand that the information, I can get the information, and I understand the council has requested it from the agency, and the agency has agreed to provide it. That's all I was saying. Okay. But absolutely, I can't plan responsibly if I don't know what the other, the other hand is doing. We do coordinate. Huh. It'd be great to see that. Thank you very much, Chairs. Thank you very much, Council Member Rosenthal. Next, we'll have Council Member Torres, followed by Council Member and Majority Leader Cumbo. Uh, so I have a, a simple hypothetical. Right? It seems to me it is unfair to fault NYCHA for a lack of resources. Right? We in the political establishment bear more responsibility for your resources than you do. But it's entirely fair to fault you or hold you accountable for how efficiently those resources are spent. So suppose I handed you a $32 billion check. How long would it take to correct all the capital needs in public housing? So I was asked that previously, yeah. and at the risk of um, reiterating uh, a very unpopular answer, Council member, I really, sitting here today, have not, I can't give you an honest, reliable answer. Um, there, it's a heavy lift, uh, and there's only so much work you can put out on the street at any point in time, and for me to give you a date now would be pure conjecture. So even if you had the resources you need, you could not assure the public that you could make the repairs as quickly as we need. The Citizens Budget Commission has reported that the rate of physical deterioration in your buildings outpaces your ability to spend dollars. Is that true? Yes, you can see it in the increase okay. in the... So, uh, so if we know that it's not only a funding issue, that the capital program is too bureaucratic, too Byzantine to address the challenges, has NYCHA given thought to creating a whole new approach? doing for NYCHA what we did for the, S, for the Department of Education, creating the School Construction Authority. Have we thought of creating a construction authority for NYCHA that's more nimble, more flexible, able to do repairs quicker, better, faster? Well, first of all, I don't, 
um, accede to the description of uh, NYCHA's lack of capacity. Um, there was, at the start of NextGen, um, a look at whether there should be a different entity. Um, changing the name and title does not change the procurement regulations, does not change uh, how much the market can absorb, which is what I was really pointing to. I wasn't pointing to how much paper we could push out. I'm pointing to the fact that the market has a capacity constraint when we're talking $32 billion and that it wouldn't be responsible for me to pull a figure out of my head right now about how long it would take us to do that work. So very quickly, um, and then I'll, so I wanna ask about, obviously the main source of funding that you have is federal funding. Um, within what time frame do you have to spend those dollars? Mm -hmm. And what happens if you fail to spend those dollars on a timely basis? We have 24 months to commit 90% of the funding and 48 to spend. Um, we are well within that. We have uh, not, uh, we've improved. We expect this year to be 90% uh, committed at 16 months, which is where we feel comfortable. Um, HUD would be able, James, I think, to um, take some funding back if we didn't meet our obligation and, and expenditure. Correct, but obligations and expenditures at the federal level have not been an issue. We cool. uh, award, as Deborah said, within 12 to 14 months um, as it relates to the grant, and we're spending within 30 to 32 months versus a 48-month statute. Uh, Ms. Goddard, how long have you been at NYCHA? A little over two years. And uh, over the course of those two years, and this is my final question, has there ever been a federal recapture of capital funds? Not from the capital fund program, no. That's a good, that's, that's, I think that's a strong accomplishment. So, so I commend you for that. Thank you. That's the extent of my questioning. Thank you, Council Member Torres. Now we'll have our Majority Leader, Council Member Cumbo. Thank you. Hello, thank you for being here, I represent uh, five NYCHA developments, Walt Whitman, Ingersoll, Farragut, Lafayette Gardens, and Atlantic Terminal. There were, prior to me coming into office, there were significant um, renovations done in both Ingersoll and Whitman as far as kitchen upgrades and bathroom upgrades and significant remodeling. But I wanted to ask um, more specifically, what does NYCHA do when the cost to rehabilitate an apartment or a building is more than the cost to replace it? Do you have uh, examples of when you have decided that it would be, as many people have brought to our attention, that it often would be cheaper to either just reconstruct a new building from the ground up versus continuing to put resources into existing buildings? We, we have engaged in those conversations, um, and obviously I'm aware of, of uh, some of the statements that have been made by um, uh, third parties. Uh, the figures are a little bit misleading. Uh, there is a figure for rehabbing, gut rehabbing, start to finish a unit, and demolishing it probably adds another couple hundred thousand per unit on top of that. When you really take into consideration taking these buildings down, the feasibility and the numbers change significantly. So you're saying that the demolition costs often do not warrant the ability to demolish a building and to build something from the ground up? Correct. Are there examples where you actually have decided to do that within this administration? Not to date. That's interesting. Let me ask you this question because I know we have limited time. So for the NYCHA developments in my district, um, you're looking at the total five-year plan um, would be close to, let's just say, $850 million. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to me, and this may have been covered by my colleagues, but all right, that's what it, that's the cost for five years, correct? Yes. Now, you have this allocation that has come from uh, the city. Do you know how much money you're putting into each recognized district that has a five-year capital plan? In other words, I'm trying to determine where is the shortfall? So this is the need, this is how much money we have for these five years, and here's the shortfall, and here's what you can expect in this five-year time plan. 
So I may need to rely on James a little bit, but um, overall in the five-year plan, we uh, expect about $1.5 billion from the federal side. Um, we have the Mayor's Roofing Initiative, which is a little, we are accelerating, is going to be between 100 and 200 million a year. Uh, we have the boilers going forward, which will take care of all about, about $300 million of our need. Um, but you can see if you put these numbers together up against um, a five-year need, it is woefully inadequate. Is it possible for each of the members to have an understanding in their district of this is your five-year need? Yes. This is how much money we have, and I'm hoping and praying that you can figure out an equitable way to determine where the resources are going to go. And then for this amount of money in this time frame, this is the level of work that you can expect to see as a result. And where you are short is here. And to be able to have some sort of conversation with, I think, the elected officials as well as the TA presidents to have an understanding of how can we work together as resources are scarce to prioritize what is the most critical for those developments as well as those elected officials. Because we have three years left. And as God is my witness, I want to see my NYCHA developments better than when I found them. And, you know, we, particularly those of us who represent NYCHA developments, we campaign on improving NYCHA developments. Mm -hmm. We campaign on providing a better way for people to live in respectable conditions. And for us to do eight year terms and to leave those developments either the way we found them or worse off would be the greatest tragedy that any one of us could ever experience. So, so I, and I know my colleagues feel this way, we want to see improvement after mm -hmm. these eight years and we want to leave our NYCHA developments in a better place as well as to have a pipeline for those who succeed us to be able to ultimately slam dunk the resources that we have put in place so that people could live in respectable, clean, healthy environments. So let me, may I offer a few things? Please, thank you. Um, so first of all, the, uh, the capital plan, the five-year capital plan for all developments is on our website, so it is available. And we are actually working to do a 10-year plan, so a longer horizon, um, which is appropriate for capital planning, number one. Uh, number two, let me just briefly say that the discipline we try to use in deciding what we do is again being very logical about the buildings, the outside, to the systems, to the apartments, but of course there's always compete, you know, there's a lots of places that need a new boiler. So then we are going to look at our PNA, which tells us three things. The, the scoring relates to three things. The remaining useful life, whether we can get parts, and operational data, because something could be old and still working well. So we look at all those three things, and we actually look at it every year. Have things changed as we create our capital plan? And then uh, third, of course, we, we'd be happy to meet with um, TA presidents, you, or any council member about what our specific plans are. I hear that. I want to just make sure that we figure out a way for us all to be at the same table to discuss, because I haven't had a meeting with my NYCHA leaders, NYCHA, and myself all together to have a clear snapshot of where we are, what resources are allocated, what are the priorities, and how can we make decisions collectively as a group in the best interest of those developments. So I look forward to having those meetings yep. with you. We'll work um, with intergovernmental to set it up. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader Cumber. Next, we'll have Council Member Carlos Menchaca. Thank you to the chairs, and I want to ask about two different areas. One is your relationship with the resident associations in general, and whether or not you do trainings and offer opportunities for them to understand this capital plan need and get them empowered. You heard from the first panel that there was an opportunity there uh, to really empower them. Second question is, the way that some of the on the ground activists are really speaking to these development needs in light of the consent decree being denied is one for good faith, $2 billion to keep going back into repairs, but really do it through a 
plan that engages the developments as, as a unit and building modernization committees that exist under the bylaws of the Citywide Council of Presidents in line with HUD's engagement regulations, CFR Part 964, or 24 CFR Part 964. So that's the only two questions I'll kind of give you, but relationship with the resident associations and what's preventing you from creating these modernization committees to really focus, say, on Red Hook East, Red Hook West, and allow, allow the resident associations to develop their plans to get stuff working. I'm going to go back a little bit to something I said um, earlier on in, in response to a similar question. Um, we are happy to engage um, with residents, uh, but I do want to be clear that we also have a fiduciary responsibility in how we spend the funds. And so the compelling logic of outside to systems to apartments isn't going to change. On the other hand, um, there are plenty of opportunities uh, where the how we do it, what are we doing in a kitchen, what are we doing on a playground, uh, how are we doing the doors, um, offer plenty of opportunity for resident input, and we do do charrettes on what age group uses the playground, what equipment do they want to see on a playground, do they want a playground, has the nature of the use of the open space changed? in kitchens and baths, you know, offer a pallet and a choice of pallets. Um. Okay, I, I think I get it, but um, I asked a very specific question about how you currently engaged. You say you're happy that you, you can engage. What, what is your current mechanism for resident association support? Do you train them? Do you bring uh, uh, information to them? I want to get a, get a, maybe it doesn't exist, and if that's the case, I want to hear that too. Yep. But I think, I think you're missing the point here is that, that you're, you're really kind of thinking about this in terms of experts, and you are the experts, and you know, you know what's going to happen, and there's nothing that's going to change. And I think you're missing the whole point here is that uh, connecting how you responded to Richie Torres' uh, questions around the fact that even if you had the money, you'd have trouble because it's hard. That's a good thing to talk to the residents about so that we all have a good sense about it on the ground. and. You can't keep all that information. This is public funding. This is this is this is not your money. This is this is our money, and Absolutely. so they should understand how it's getting spent and the issues and the difficulties, so they can be part of this mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. And and I just that that's been my number one frustration with 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 NYCHA thus far, and not allowing for for the empowerment of resident associations. So they're not just talking about a playground here and a, and or not or of an appliance this choice, they're really understanding the whole concept that you're, you are struggling with. And I think through that participatory process, you can get buy-in from NYCHA residents and the associations, and they can join your team, when right now they're just fighting you because you, you're, not, mm -hmm. you're not being transparent as possible. So what is your relationship with the resident yeah. associations? And, and we're gonna have to work on cracking this concept and this frame of mind, because I think it's, it's incredibly toxic and uh, unhelpful. So we do not have direct relationships and capital with the resident associations. The HUD mechanism is the resident advisory board, and that's where we do take in, we present our draft plan, we come back two or three times later. Um, I have talked to resident engagement about um, meeting at the zone level or at the site level, because I do agree with you. Um, if you can put stuff out there, uh, and people can understand the choices you have to make. Um, they can maybe not always agree with you, but understand what you're doing. And my final note is, I think you understand from the first panel that they understand too. And so let's talk to them as partners, because that's exactly what they are. They are the owners of this property as the people. And I, I want to I see more of that from NYCHA. So help, let us help you make that happen. Not a problem. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. Um, I wanted to ask a question specific, um, since I do have a 
Albany history um, in terms of the status of some of the state money. Um, the FY 2016 state budget, there was a $100 million commitment uh, that was funneled through DASNY, Dormitory Authority, in the state to develop a spending plan, and then the money was funneled through HCR, um, Division of State Homes and Community Renewal. So I wanted to ask about that. And then in your testimony, you referenced $450 million coming from the state. So that does not include this $100 million, because subsequent after that, in 2018, there was $200 million committed. And then FY 2019, 250, which brings us to the 450. So could you give us a status update on the projects, as well as how much of that 100 million we have drawn down? And then I'm going to assume, and I'm probably correct, the $450 million that's in the remainder from 2018 and 2019, that money has not been drawn down at all. So I'll start there. You're absolutely correct. Okay. Um, uh, the state has not released the funding, and that's the funding they said they would not release a couple weeks ago when we talked with them until there was a monitor in place. Mm -hmm. So we are clearly um, in limbo on those funds. As to the $100 million that went to DASNY, it might have sat at HCR for a bit, but uh, it would have simply been a fiscal conduit if that happened. It's DASNY that's administering the money. Okay. And I did not come prepared today to speak to how far along they are in expenditures. Um, last time I looked at it, they are in the 40% range, because they were 30 before. I think they're, they're in maybe the 40 to 50% range of expenditure. Okay. Um, okay, so we still have a, a little ways to go. But we can go. get you the firm answer on that. Okay. Well, no, that's uh, an increase. The last time I got an update, which was last year, we were about 30%. Yes. yes. And a lot of that money relates to uh, building intercom, key fob, uh, door replacements, and things of that nature. Minor, not um, some of the larger capital work, correct? We, correct. We had um, proposed that that money go towards roofs in sort of partnership with the mayors making a commitment on roofs. Um, but the state sought to do otherwise. Okay. And then with yesterday's decision um, rejecting the federal consent uh, decree, what do you think will be the impact? I know there's a deadline that we now have to meet. So is there any insight you can give us on what we should expect over the next few weeks? To be honest with you, I am not the right person for that. Okay. You're right. We have to, uh, both parties are supposed to submit something to the judge by December 14th. And I think that's where a lot of people are today, trying to figure out what that means and how to move forward. In the meantime, as you know, um, we have been paying attention to lead and mold, creating a healthy homes unit. We've been paying attention to compliance. We, in anticipation of the money at Capitol, have been mapping sites in terms of trying to determine where's the overlap. We've already done some system investments, some exterior building investments. If we're going to tackle, for instance, mold, that's kitchens and baths. Where should we come down? So we've been mapping that stuff out to help prioritize ourselves. Okay. So that question be answered by someone at the executive level in another unit? I think the chair and the um, GM. And a general manager. Yes. Okay, great. Um, wanted to ask a question and go back to the 2017 uh, P&A. Um, moving forward, now that the assessment has been done, is NYCHA required to provide any performance measurements or progress report of what has been done towards that dollar figure? So if it's $32 billion, um, if you have to provide a progress report or anything during the interim, um, is that on the book? So is that something you do automatically or are you mandated to do it if it has to be done at all? We do file with HUD every year on the annual plan, how we're spending the money, what's been completed, and how we're doing on ex uh, obligations and expenditures by project. Um, additionally, actually, the, um, the P&A this year included also the purchase of a new software program, um, which will feed completed projects in automatically, so we'll have a very robust system to track um, the reduction in the P&A project by project. Okay. And do you get feedback from HUD on the annual uh, submission, or is it just an? It's a fairly ministerial submission. Okay, so just informational purposes. Yeah, they would look to you know make sure that we're spending our money uh, appropriately. That's on capital improvements, um, uh, but there isn't a lot of uh, scrutiny. Okay, 
And then the program managers that you talked earlier about that we are looking to hire, will they be through a third party contractor or that yes. would be NYCHA staff? No, they'll be third party contractors. Okay, do you know how many? Um, at this point, I'm looking at two, um, but we will uh, go to the board with the option of increasing depending how much, for instance, if the, you know, depending what happens with the SDNY when that funding comes through. So we'll maintain flexibility. Okay. And moving forward, in terms of 2019 uh, priorities with the state, um, there are changes that are coming to Albany, thank God. Um, do we anticipate any priorities that NYCHA will have for the state, for the governor and the new state leaders? Um, InterGov will be, we'll start meeting with them to, to talk both ways, what our needs are and what their interest is. Um, from a capital perspective, um, if we could finish out our boilers, and move forward and be, you know, on a, on a replacement, life cycle replacement, that would be a great corner to turn for us, but I am speaking as the EVP for capital planning and InterGov hasn't asked me yet. Okay, well, two priorities for me, uh, design build authority, and I wanna draw down on a $450 million. We and I would love to see more of a commitment from the state, um, simply because years ago when I was there, I remember us um, doing away with the state supervised developments and giving them to the federal government. So now all of NYCHA is under the feds. Um, so I would love to see more improvements from the state. I hope my colleagues, my former colleagues are listening. We share that those sentiments. Okay, and then another priority for me, and I've talked about it, but it's always important to emphasize, I do wanna see more of an investment on interior yep. apartment repairs. Um, in light of the PNA for 2017, recognizing that that is a priority, I do want uh, you to go back and talk to your colleagues, the GM and the chair, about how we can invest more in apartment upgrades. <laughs> and if we can expedite that, that will be great as well. So if the design can be expedited to six months, I mean, let's go for the gusto, let's do three months, that'd be great, <laughs> um, to see if we can really get some apartment upgrades um, underway. I think that would be a real recognition of the priority and really to all the residents here, I think it would tell them uh, that we do recognize the interior is just as important as exterior. We hear you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'll turn it back over to my co-chair. Over the past couple of days, we've heard a lot about this um, Amazon deal. Yes. And um, the mayor and a lot of people had an opinion about um, how the residents of NYCHA can benefit um, from Amazon um, moving into New York City and um, Long Island City and the NYCHA developments that's in the Long Island City area. Um, have you had any conversations at all with this administration or provided any kind of plans or projections or how um, NYCHA can benefit from this deal uh, with capital repairs or in any kind of way? We have not, but we do know that the state has a standard process for planning um, the use uh, of funds, and we expect that NYCHA will be partners with the city in those conversations. Okay, thank you. And um, I did have a, an actual line of questions related to financing deals and um, really related to um, the funding and revenue streams that will come from all the development um, and how that could, um, be able to address all of the capital repair needs and we weren't able to ask a lot of those questions because of the real estate not being here and um, also the fact that um, next gen 2.0 has not been released and so I would I really hope that that plan is um, is released soon so that we can really get a sense of what NYCHA has planned for revenue and addressing the needs and be able to have another conversation, even if it's a, a roundtable discussion with some serious stakeholders. Um, I think we'd be, we would love to participate in the roundtable conversations and we share your, your hopes. So we look forward to receiving that as well as the list of yes. all of the deals within our um, respective council districts. So um, with that. Oh, just one more. Um, you know, since Christmas is around the corner, I like to develop my wish list early. 
Um, but in addition to everything I described in terms of 2019 priorities, I just want to recap um, some of the things we've talked about where we're recognizing that there are significant changes that are happening, whether it's the design process, we're expediting that design from 12 months to six months. Um, I'm going to push to three months. Um, the procurement changes in terms of some of the, con the bids that are being rejected for various reasons, but also I would say better recruitment. You talked about mm -hmm. that of more bidders. Um, that's something that my committee has been looking at agency by agency because yeah. I think we put ourselves in a box when we work with the same bidders all the time. You know, we're forced to either accept with a higher price or reject and start the process all over. And I think many of my colleagues and I have experienced individual projects where there's been inconsistencies in contracts and we've had to start all over. So my basketball court is another year and the residents on the ground have to deal with that delay. Um, Interagency coordination is something that we've been harping on a lot mm -hmm. because NYCHA can do everything it can, but if DOB and DEP and OMB and the Comptroller's Office Office, and all the other agencies that work with you are not also doing their part, then we blame you guys. That's usually how it happens. And so I want to make sure that the conversations are actively happening through this process and where the council can be helpful, uh, we appreciate that. You know, the communication can always improve and we want to make sure that we're helping during the process, not just during the budget conversations, right? They will start in January, but this is something we should be doing year round. And, and certainly as chair of the subcommittee, working with our finance chair, Danny Drum, uh, we want to make sure that we're doing that as well. Um, the program managers you talked about, we're looking at two possibly um, in terms of some of the vacancies you're dealing with that total number of 44 um, and then you talked about 18 I believe consultants that you're working with as well um, how we can help with better recruitment some of our partners maybe colleges and other entities where we can do uh, I'm a big fan of job fairs huge just had a few um, earlier this year um, dealing with headcount and then anything else that I didn't describe I think I got everything um, but really wanted to, you know, keep talking about some of those procedural changes. I mean, it may sound boring, but these are the types of things that delay projects that the public doesn't understand. So they will blame us for the delay, and then we blame you, and then we look internally and find out what that inconsistency is. So to the best that we can, the level of consistency and detail and communication, interagency partnership with all of our stakeholders, we really can start to put a real dent. Um, I recognize $32 billion is a high price tag. I wish I could write a check for $1.6 billion just for my developments. Um, and I agree with the majority leader. Every day that we wake up, we're trying to make things better for our residents and families. And really, the legacy that we leave behind. We don't want to leave office in three years and our districts are worse off. Um, that means we haven't done our job. Uh, we do want to make it better. And I know it almost seems insurmountable and impossible, but um, I appreciate a lot of the work that has been happening and that is going to continue to happen. And most importantly, I really appreciate the voices of the tenants. Uh, many of them call us morning, noon, night, weekends, and every other time, and rightfully so, because they do need a voice and they always want to make sure that uh, their voices are at the table. And so the community engagement with CCOP and other tenant leaders that are in place is really important from the perspective of partnership and letting folks know what's going on. Um, I try to meet with NYCHA once a month to go over my individual projects because when residents ask me, I need to have an answer. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have an answer, you ha guys have to give me an answer. Um, and so I appreciate a lot of the work that has been done and we do have a lot more work to do, but I appreciate that there are efforts in place to really look at internally a lot of the processes like procurement and like design, like staff and recruitment and retention uh, that need to be addressed. And a lot of the savings that you have and some of the underruns are really critical because we can expedite even more projects, right? And get our design to three months. Um, <laughs> and so I thank you. I'm I'm very ambitious because I don't think anything is impossible when you have people together that want to achieve the same thing. Uh, we really can make a difference. So I thank you for coming today. We do have one more panel after. 
after you, so I ask you to stay behind. Sure. Just like you heard from the tenants, I want you to hear from some of the other advocacy groups and the fiscal uh, watchdogs that do a lot of great work and really oversight um, over agencies. So I thank you, and I'll turn it back over to my co-chair. Thank you so much. And so now we'll transition to the f actual last panel. I just want to thank you and the committees for your support and the conversation, and we will keep it going. Thank you. JT Falcone, United Neighborhood Houses. Caitlin Jose from Live On New York. Sean Campion from Citizens Budget Commission. And Lisa Coswell from the Daycare Council of New York. And this is the last panel for this hearing. can start with JT and um, please everyone just state your name and your organization for the record. Good afternoon, Chair Amprey Samuel and Chair Gibson. Uh, I'm JT Falcone with United Neighborhood Houses. United Neighborhood Houses is a membership group for New York City settlement houses and our members include 40 New York City settlement houses and two upstate affiliate members. 23 of our members operate out of sites owned by the New York City Housing Authority, where they offer a wide range of services and run over 125 different programs, including cornerstones, early childhood education, and senior centers. These centers have not been immune to the infrastructural challenges that plague the authority's aging facilities portfolio. A recent article in the Wall Street Journal noted that an estimated $500 million is needed for vital repairs. We're here today with our colleagues from the Daycare Council and Live On to recommend reforms that could provide relief to community-based organizations operating these centers without adding stress to NYCHA's financial situation. I'm going to dive right into these reforms. Uh, we'd hope to see a redirection of fines. Right now, the way that the process works is that providers who are operating out of NYCHA spaces uh, can submit repair tickets and repair requests to NYCHA. Uh, and because of the backlog in, in repairs, uh, these requests can sit for a long period, and in the meanwhile, they can be uh, cited by, via, by uh, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, or FDNY, for violations. So on top of repair costs, they're also looking at uh, fines for violations, and uh, we would ask that these violations that have been reported to NYCHA could be directed to NYCHA, uh, as they are the maintainers of the space. Um, we're also looking at interagency cooperation. These services are contracted by the Administration for Children's Services, by Department for the Aging, uh, Department of Education, Department of Youth and Community Development, and all of these agencies have different protocols for how they cooperate with NYCHA and how they work together, uh, and that should be something that we could all coordinate and work together to develop an interagency process that's consistent and clear and standardized. Uh, and finally, an approval process for repairs. In many cases, uh, our members can raise the capital to make these improvements, and then when they approach NYCHA for approval, uh, those dollars can sit for, we've heard, some instances of years, because there's a, a, an approval process that takes too long, and it's not clear, and it's not uh, consistent. Again, consistency is a key theme here. We're looking forward to working with City Council and with NYCHA to uh, find ways to implement these repairs. We understand that the financial situation is such that NYCHA is prioritizing residential repairs, and that's important and that's key. These services help residents to thrive as well, and they develop and maintain the communities that exist within NYCHA buildings, and so it's important that we find ways to make sure that they can continue to provide these services. Thank you. My name is Caitlin Hosey. I'm here on behalf of Lavelle in New York. We're thank you to the chairs for the opportunity to testify, and we're pleased to be here with JT from UNH and Lisa from the Daycare Council to provide um, really the same recommendations that were just outlined. 
Um, first and foremost, we want to speak to the 38% of NYCHA households that are headed by an individual that's age 62 or older. Um, there's an estimated 7,700 units designated specifically for older adults. Um, so we wholly support all of the recommendations to um, raise the conditions in the units that was mentioned by Councilmember Goodson and throughout the testimony today. Um, again, there's an estimated 500 million in capital funding that is needed specifically for the community spaces that are operating in NYCHA. So these spaces are, are not um, separate from these issues. There might be a, root, a leak on the third floor that impacts the facilities um, on the spaces below, and these have a real impact on the lives of the tenants, um, specifically if it's a cooling center or whatever it may be for the residents. Um, we would like to support the recommendations that were given and specifically to note that for providers, there's a lot of time spent on trying to navigate these issues, trying to navigate these fines, trying to navigate the processes. So a transparent um, process moving forward that is standardized across agencies as is appropriate would be something that's wholly supported. That way the agencies that are operating in these spaces are able to get back to what they really want to do, which is providing social services to the tenants. Additionally, as um, programs move forward, such as NYCHA Next Gen and whatever it may be, as changes go on in NYCHA developments, we really need that for the community-based service providers to be kept in the loop as to what is going on because often they're on the front lines of answering questions the tenants may have and to the extent possible we need them to be partners with NYCHA and to be considered as such so that they are able to bet to the best of their ability, support the tenants, answer questions and really be a resource um, to NYCHA, to the community that they wish to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Amper Samuel and Chair Gibson. Uh, my name is Sean Campy, and I'm a senior research associate at the Citizens Budget Commission. Um, CBC is a nonprofit, nonpartisan civic organization whose mission is to achieve constructive change in the finances and services of New York State and New York City governments. Um, as we discussed today, NYCHA has an astounding $32 billion in capital needs, uh, which is a nearly five-fold increase over the last decade. Um, today, nearly all of its properties require substantial rehabilitation, on average about $181,000 per unit. And without dramatic action, up to 90% of, of NYCHA's 176,000 units of public housing could deteriorate to the point which are no longer cost-effective to repair within the next decade. In July, CBC released a report called Stabilizing the Foundation, which identified the root causes of NYCHA's capital need crisis and proposed strategies that the city and the housing authority uh, can use to mitigate the deterioration, stabilize the system, and start to improve ten tenants' quality of life. Our report identified three root causes for the deterioration. First was that NYCHA's capital funding over the last 15 years was essentially flat, even as its needs and the cost to address them continued to grow. Inefficiencies in both NYCHA's capital planning and operations reduced the impact of the capital investments that the authority did make. And third, NYCHA and the city have made extremely limited use of alternative strategies that could have addressed more of NYCHA's needs. Um, and to address the crisis, we recommended pursuing four strategies which I'll go through quickly in the interest of time. First, we recommended the city should fully integrate NYCHA into its affordable housing strategy. Um, the majority of uh, the New York City's affordable housing needs for those uh, with incomes at or below 50% AMI, which is exactly the population that NYCHA serves. And incorporating NYCHA into the city's housing plan will more appropriately shift the unit distribution and perhaps more than a billion dollars for NYCHA to preserve these units. Second, we recommended that NYCHA should transition from being a landlord to an affordable housing steward that manages fewer buildings. Um, this means that NYCHA needs to take full advantage of public-private partnerships through RAD and converting more units to Section 8, which offer a more fa stable funding source and the ability to re leverage additional funds. Um, third, that NYCHA should leverage underutilized land assets to fund repairs and facilitate new development, um, which is both you know, through infill um, of 8020 projects to raise more money for repairs as well as the sale of air rights, which could raise an additional $1.5 billion. And finally, the NYCHA needs to improve its operations and construction management um, to um, do more work during the standard workday at a reasonable cost, um, increase use of pr uh, private maintenance contracts to add capacity to the skilled trade divisions, um, and also to seek approval for design build and other construction methods that will save billions of dollars in capital repairs. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to answering any questions that you have.
Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Caswell. Uh, thank you very much for holding this hearing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chairs Gibson and Amprey Samuels. I represent the Daycare Council of New York. Uh, we're 70 years old this year. Uh, we have over 200 uh, child care providers in the uh, city, and a good number of them are in NYCHA facilities. Um, we have also provide uh, labor relations and mediation advocacy and early childhood career ladder and employment support, and we're the head of the child care resource and referral system for New York City. Um, right now, what, what we want you to know is that we've been at this for a while, and we're really glad um, that you're putting more pressure on the situation. Uh, over the last three years, we've been consistently raising these issues with the Administration for Children's Services. We've met with the Department of Health and Mental Health, and we've also recently met with uh, the deputy mayor to be able to see what can happen. And he has gone to visit some of our member centers and begun to work closely with NYCHA. But what we really are, are excited about is the fact that um, the three of us can begin to work together and get something done. So we completely support the recommendations. Um, we also did some recent research on our member settings. In February, we distributed a child care policy survey uh, to find out what was happening in terms of buildings and facilities for our members. Uh, the results were that of the 65 daycare council represented child care programs in NYCHA buildings, 53 percent had some form of building related violation. Uh, between 2016 and 2018, the most common violations were, late, were related to lead paint cited across all categories of violations and rodents and insects and other pests, flooding, lack of hot water or heat, and electrical and plumbing issues. I know you're familiar with all of these issues because of what you've heard already, but we have the data, we have the research, um, and we're extremely concerned. I'll spare you the um, story that's in our testimony from one of our members. Uh, we've had situations where there's been uh, steam heat coming out of uh, parts of the playgrounds, um, it's really not right. And uh, it, it's an ineffective use of public funding at this point to not address it, because in some cases our provider centers have had to close down, and we've already had our colleagues talk about fees that are coming to our member centers when they should be going to NYCHA uh, from DOHMH. So I'm, I thank you again for the work you're doing, and we remain available and um, are pleased to be working together. Thanks. Do you have separate um, meetings at all? I remember NYCHA used to have a meeting with UNH, um, this work group. Um, do they still have those work group meetings? Do you participate? So those work group meetings, uh, we're working right now with the executive team to reinstate them. Uh, they're something that we've connected with um, with Brezhnev's team, uh, Chair Brezhnev's team, to, to work to reinstate. And also, we're working with our colleagues at Live On and Daycare Council to coordinate our membership so as to most effectively streamline these conversations and ensure that, in as far as we're reaching out to all of these agencies and, and working to coordinate conversations there as well, and, and with the Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson, that we're doing so as a, as a group because these issues are consistent across all of our membership right. organizations. And this morning, one of the members of Deputy Mayor Thompson's staff addressed the Daycare Council and talked about those meetings which have begun again. Uh, so they're working more effectively with strong leadership, but they need a lot of support. Okay, maybe we can begin, um, we can be included in those meetings to yes. look at how we can maybe incorporate yes. some of these issues in the budget, so. We'd all be um, happy to help facilitate that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> and so, nothing else, right? So this concludes the community um, public hearing and oversight with NYCHA's 2017 physical Needs, fiscal needs assessment um, on November 15th with the uh, Public Housing Committee and the Capital Budget Subcommittee. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. And might I add, we finished at exactly 1 o'clock. We have a triple joint hearing coming up. So if anyone wants to stay, please join us. We're talking about public charge. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Have a great day and be safe. <laughs>